Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end as we will hold a 30-minute networking session in the neural network. Here you can meet, ask questions to our distinguished speakers, connect and chat with the AI for Good community. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Hello everyone, I'm hoping you can all hear me. Um, welcome everyone to the ITU WMO webinar on artificial intelligence for natural disaster management. My name is Michael e. Menon and I'm the advisor of the focus group on AI for natural disaster management. I'm speaking to you all from Geneva, Switzerland. My colleagues will link the program of today's webinar in the chat. Today's webinar has been divided into four sessions. The first session is dedicated to four keynotes followed by the second session, which will focus on the role of AI in forecasting and projection of natural disasters. The third session will address how AI can be leveraged for effective communications during disasters. The last session, session four, will look at how AI can be utilized to examine and monitor data streams to detect disasters in real time. We're honored to have the esteemed director of the Telecommunications Standardization Bureau of the ITU, Dr. Chase Lee, with us today. Without any further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Chase Lee to give us his opening remarks. Dr. Lee. Yes, thank you very much, Maitri. Welcome and very good day to you all for joining us today. It is my honor to welcome you to the AI for Good webinar on AI for Natural Disaster Management. We are delighted to co-organize this webinar with the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, and the UN Environment. While the global focus has been on tackling the COVID-19 pandemic, natural hazards and the, uh, disasters continued. For example, in recent years, the Philippines faced a typhoon Bangkok and the cyclone Ampan affected both India and Bangladesh. These disasters have resulted in heavy casualties and severe economic losses. The world is increasingly turning to new and the emerging technologies to gain a holistic perspective of monitoring, exchanging, and processing information before and after the advent of disasters to minimize the influence. In addition, it aims to improve the performance of emergency management systems and multi-hazard alert systems. Disaster prediction can be based on frontier technologies like AI, for aggregating and analyzing data to detect different types of disasters and employ a drones supports humanitarian responses and disaster recovery relief activities, including evacuation and the provision of food and medical supplies. The IT is collaborating with the WMO and the UN environment to examine further how AI can be leveraged for real-time detection of disaster events, forecasting disasters, and ensuring effective communication during disasters. The focus group on AI for natural disaster management is a collaboration platform established in December 2020. The focus group is currently looking into the adoption of AI for disaster preparation and the mitigation phases, and has over 10 topic groups covering various kinds of hazards, including flooding, tsunami, uh, landslides, insect plot, snow avalanches, volcanic eruption, wildfires, hailstones, and vector-borne infectious diseases. While also del uh, delving into AI-powered decision support systems, multi-hazard systems, etc., to boost effective communications during disasters. We have distinguished speakers in our midst today who will elaborate on how AI can be 
leveraged further to deal with the disasters in different regions, while also exploring AI-based hazard communication tools. We will also be made privy to new use cases on wildfires, landslides, storms, earthquakes, and tsunamis, which are anticipated to fill into the ongoing work of uh, focus group AI for natural disaster management. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank WMO and the UN Environment for their continued commitment and partnership towards the focus group. We do hope that we can further our understanding of employing AI within the domain of disaster management through the excellent lineup of presentations we have today. I wish you all a fruitful webinar today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for the remarks, and I'm hoping you all can hear me again. Um, we will now proceed with the second opening remarks. So today we're privileged to have Dr. Lu Jürg Lutterbacher, the Director of Science and Innovation from the World Meteorological Organization. Dr. Lutterbacher, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Thiele, for the introduction. Dear colleagues, good day to everyone. On behalf of the World Meteorological Organization, I welcome you to today's webinar, which will explore the opportunities of new technologies in the area of disaster management and the provision of potential solution using machine learning, big data analytics, as well as artificial intelligence. The webinar will provide an overview of how AI can be leveraged to enhance modeling across spatial temporal scales and provide scientific advancements on the detection, forecasting, and uh, of natural hazards and disasters. The webinar will also shed light on how to reduce disaster risks using new technology advancements and ways of effective communication. The IPCC AR4 reports and the discussions at COP26 last year in Glasgow have shown that all that we are all exposed to natural hazards and this will worsen in the future and we need to act upon accordingly. Since the initiation of the focus group on artificial intelligence for natural disaster management has been highlighted by Dr. Lee. Uh, more than one year ago, the WMO together with UNEP and ITU, as well as many partners from other organizations in academia have recognized the importance and the relevance of data modeling and communication related to disaster risk reduction. Through WMO's unique role at the interface of science and innovation, infrastructure, services, and member states, it is also an ideal position to support standardization of innovative technologies such as artificial intelligence and to provide proper multi-hazard early warning systems for all. As Dr. Lee, I would like to thank very much ITU and UNEP and colleagues from all over the world for excellent collaboration in the frame of this focus group. But I would like to thank also very much to all the participants today in this important webinar. And I'm very much looking forward to many interesting and exciting talks, discussions, and interactions through this platform. Thank you very much. And back to you, Mithili. Thank you, Dr. Jörg, for your remarks and for being with us today. We highly appreciate it. We will now move on to the opening remarks provided by Dr. Murli Tumarkuri, who is the acting head of the Resilience to Disasters and Conflicts Global Support Branch at the United Nations Environment Program. Over to you. Thank you, Maitili. Uh, dear colleagues from WMO as well as ITU, other friends and participants of this webinar. I'm once again extremely delighted that we are having one more webinar on natural disasters and the role of artificial intelligence. Over the past year and a half, we have conducted a number of events in this series. I think our first event uh, was in October at the World Disaster Risk Collection Day. And it, it's a tremendous success which showed how much importance and how much interest is there in this topic. 
that led to the establishment of the focus group. And since then, the focus group has been working diligently in multiple areas and generating case studies as to where AI is used or has the potential to be used in disaster risk management. This morning, I was reviewing a report on international humanitarian action and how it is changing in the face of climate crisis. And it is so, there's so much more disasters happening now. It's, it's absolutely shocking. We, we know it, we see it, we feel it. But yet when it comes into numbers, I was reading recently that up to 83% of the new crisis are cl climate linked. And the number of disasters are almost tripled in the last 20 years. More than 6,000 disasters, more than 8,000 disasters in the last 20 years, which needed human humanitarian response. So disasters are real, disasters are here and happening now. And the more early warning we have, the more prepared we are, the less will be the humanitarian tragedy. And reducing that humanitarian tragedy and not upsetting our development tra trajectory is our ultimate objective. There is tremendous growth of technology, not only in AI, but also in drones and robotics happening. But how do we harness these new technologies in the domain of disaster management. This is the purpose of the focus group and this is also the subject of this webinar. Over the past 18 months, we have presented to you a number of areas where specifically we demonstrated how Google is working on floods and how other agencies are working on wildfire and so on and so forth. Today, there'll be more case studies. The very fact that we are bringing people together is creating more applications and more use studies will come in due course. And we hope that this collaboration and also this outreach, which we are doing, will prompt more and more use cases of AI and natural disaster management. Today's seminar, particularly for focus on forecasting, and this is one area which can really save millions of lives and a lot of infrastructure. You know the famous case in India where the super cyclone in 1999 killed over 100,000 people. And 15 years later, when a similar cyclone happened in the same area, the death was less than 1,000. And the difference was forecasting. So if we could use the power of technology, there they use the power of satellite images, but if we could combine that with the power of AI and make more, better, wider, more accurate predictions, certainly it will save lives. Let's strive towards that. I want to thank WMO as well as ITU for the continued support, all the speakers, and also the audience who are joined in today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morley, uh, for your opening remarks. We highly appreciate your presence here today at today's webinar. Um, so we will now move on to the first session of today's webinar. Um, and we have an exciting list of keynotes up ahead. So without further ado, I would like to call upon Dr. Monique Kuklich, who's the focus group on AI for Natural Disaster Management Chair to take the floor. Over to you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I believe that um, my slides are available. Perfect, okay, thank you. So um, first of all, I'd like to say many thanks to everyone for participating in the fourth virtual workshop of the ITU WMO UNET focus group on AI for natural disaster management. My name is Monique Koglich, and alongside serving as chair of the focus group, I'm the innovation manager at Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute in Germany. 
Now, as some of you might be aware, uh, yesterday the focus group celebrated its one year anniversary. And since our establishment, we've organized these types of virtual workshops regularly in an effort to meet and engage with experts and stakeholders in this field. For me personally, these events bring great inspiration and motivation, showcasing the tremendous potential of AI for natural disaster management, but also revealing outstanding challenges that we as a community must address to further its implementation. And both of these themes are central to the objectives of the focus group. So if you'll join me for the next 10 minutes, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about these objectives and how we plan to achieve them. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now, natural disasters are damaging physical events of predominantly natural origins. So they can be atmospheric, hydrologic, geophysical, oceanographic, or biologic. And I'd like to acknowledge that in some communities, there's some controversy surrounding the use of this expression, but many natural scientists and other stakeholders recognize and use the term. Impacts of natural disasters can include injury, mortality, displacements, damage to property, including cultural heritage and infrastructure, and disturbance to nature and natural resources. And in fact, a recent report from UNDRR, CRED, IRSS, and UC Louvain showed that 389 uh, 89 natural disasters, excluding uh, biological disasters, that occurred in 2020 impacted 98.4 million people, caused 15,000 deaths, and cost 171 billion US dollars. Unfortunately, the impacts of natural disasters are exacerbated in certain regions, such as small island developing states and least developed countries, and for certain populations, such as women and children. And they're also expected to worsen due to population growth, rapid urban development, and a growing frequency and intensity of some events. Next slide, please. Thank you. Consequently, they're addressed in the activities of many UN organizations and programs, including the SDGs and policy guiding publications. And in addition, they will feature prominently in the next issue of the WMO Bulletin, which will be published on World Meteorological Day, the 23rd of March. So I hope that you have a chance to look at that. Next slide, please. Through advances in AI-based algorithms, a growth in computational power, and the emergence of large and often publicly available data sets, there's been an increase in the use of data and AI-driven approaches to solve tasks in many scientific fields, such as fintech and medicine. And this raises some questions. Through tapping the potential of AI, can we improve our understanding of natural hazards, our ability to detect events in real time, our ability to forecast events, and our ability to effectively communicate an impending or ongoing disaster? What are the best practices when using AI and what are the limitations? So this figure, which was published in the February 2021 issue of EOS shows some priority areas. For instance, creating documentation, with standards and repositories to facilitate sharing and discovery, generating new benchmarks and developing architectures and frameworks catered to the needs of geospatial data. Next slide, please. So we're exploring best practices in data collection, monitoring, and handling to support the training and testing of AI-based algorithms. We're looking at how AI-based algorithms can be used for detecting and forecasting events, and we're looking at how AI-based algorithms can contribute to effective communication. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. High-quality data are the foundation of AI-based algorithms. So some specific questions to explore are, what requirements should data meet when being used to train or test an AI-based algorithm? So for instance, what are the best practices when it comes to data collection and storage, data quality and pre-processing, spatiotemporal resolution and extent of data, and the representativeness of data? Can AI-based algorithms be used to enhance data quantity? So using AI-based algorithms, can we detect changes and landscape features in remotely sensed imagery? and create data sets that reflect those changes. And using methods like federated learning, can we avoid data export issues? Can AI-based algorithms be used to enhance data quality as well? Can they help us locate inhomogeneities in our data sets? Next slide, please. Thank you. AI-based algorithms can be used to enhance and improve the traditional models used to develop numerical-based forecasts and physics or data-driven projections of natural disasters. They can also be used to detect features in real-time data streams and support early warning systems. 
in this context, some of the questions that we want to explore are what is the current gold standard method to detect or forecast events? And how can AI-based algorithms bring these methods to the next level? How can AI-based algorithms be used to leverage synergies from different data sources more effectively? How can they help us identify complex relationships and patterns in data? And what should be considered when we evaluate an AI-based algorithm? Next slide, please. The Sendai framework advises us to develop, maintain, and strengthen people-centered, multi-hazard, multi-sectoral forecasting and early warning systems, disaster risk and communications mechanisms, social technologies, and hazard monitoring telecommunication systems. So here are some of the questions that we'd like to explore are, once a natural disaster has been detected or forecast, how can AI assist with the immediate response? For example, through early warning systems, through push messages to cell phones, through automated translation services, chatbots, decision support systems, or dashboards? And how do we ensure that communications methods are reliable and trusted by the population? Are they accompanied by a clear set of protocols to ensure that individuals know how to respond? Next slide, please. These topics are gonna to be explored and used to produce a series of deliverables. We're gonna be holding more workshops such as today that bring together experts and stakeholders, highlight groundbreaking activities in this topic and encourage participation in the focus group. We're building a roadmap of AI activities in these areas of natural disaster management. This is essentially a database of ongoing pre-standardization and standardization work which will enable us to do a gap analysis. We're making a glossary of common technical terms and definitions to ensure that experts in different fields are all speaking the same language. We're making non-normative technical reports that summarize the findings of our analyses based on input from selected use cases. And we're producing educational materials to make sure that the content of the technical reports are accessible to all stakeholders and to support capacity building. Next slide, please. Thank you. To achieve this, we're building a community of experts and stakeholders. Now, our focus group is based at the International Telecommunications Union, which is the UN body responsible for information and communications technologies, and which is a standard developing organization. ITU focus groups provide an ideal platform for such an exchange. They support the efforts of an associated ITU study group. For instance, the mandate of the parent study group at the focus group includes telecommunications for disaster relief early warning, network resiliency and recovery. They provide a working environment for pre-standardization or standardization activities in a chosen area, and they can be rapidly established and they have the freedom to choose working methods, leadership, financing, and desired outputs. In other words, the deliverables on the previous slide. Next slide, please. Our focus group converges the ICT expertise of the ITU with the natural disaster expertise from the WMO and UN environment and provides a platform for international, multi-stakeholder and interdisciplinary collaboration on this topic. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now the focus group has a multi-tiered structure. So uh, at the bottom, you'll see these colorful tiles. These represent our topic groups. Our topic groups are clusters of experts who are exploring how AI is being used for a specific application and natural hazard. In other words, our clusters of use cases. So you can see we have a cluster of use cases looking at how AI can be used for flood monitoring and detection. We also have a topic group looking at how AI can be used for hail and windstorm hazard mapping. Above those clusters of topic groups, you can see we have three working groups, our working group on data, modeling, and communication. And these working groups are dedicated to drafting the three technical reports that I mentioned. They digest the output of the topic groups, survey the body of literature, and connect with experts to look at how is AI being used in the field, what are the best practices, and what are the challenges when using AI. Specifically, they're exploring the best practices when it comes to data. And this working group is being co-chaired by Arif Albayrak from NASA headquarters and Alison Craddock from NASA JPL. They're looking at modeling, this working group has been co-chaired by Jackie Ma from Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute and Andrea Toretti from the European Commission's JRC and communication. And this working group has been co-chaired by Ivanka Pelevan from Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute and Tom Ward from IBM. And I'd like to mention that you'll be able to meet Andrea and Alice later today when they moderate sessions two and four respectively. 
The fourth working group is dedicated to building the roadmap, and this is being chaired by David Oman from UNSCC. He'll be moderating session three of today's webinar. And finally, we recently established a work stream that's exploring tools, including online platforms, that can support AI for natural disaster management. And this activity has been co-chaired by Rudy Vengaswamy and Anirudh Kuhl from Space ML Pinterest. Our colleagues at the ITU TSC Secretariat, Maitali Menon and Hiba Tahawi keep the focus group on track and support the management team. And if you go to the next slide, you can see who we are. Thank you. It consists of uh, myself, uh, Elena Shaplaki from the University of Gießen, Jörg Gluterbacher, who you saw previously, um, who's the Director of Science and Innovation and the Chief Scientist at the WMO, uh, Muralithu Marakudi, who you also saw previously, who's the Operations Manager at the Crisis Management Branch of UN Environment. We have Srinivas Chaganti from the Department of Telecommunications in India, Rakia Babamaji from the National Space Research and Development Agency and UNDRR GRAF as well as AFSTEG DRR in Nigeria. And we have Yan Chan Wang, who's from China Telecom. Next slide, please. So here is my favorite slide. It's where I ask you all to consider getting involved in our activities. Um, first, I would encourage you to visit our website. There you can find our onboarding document, which gives guidance on how to create a free IT user account. Um, you can register to join our mailing list. This is where you'll hear about other events, such as this webinar. Um, you can register for events, such as our workshops and meetings. Um, it'll show you how to use our remote participation platform. It'll enable you to access our collaboration site. That's where we keep our documentation. And it'll also enable you to submit written contributions. So I'd just like to mention that um, our next meeting will be in Geneva, the 7th to 9th of June. It's going to be a hybrid event. Um, everyone is welcome. And um, I hope to see you there either on site or online. Uh, the last slide, if you may. Thank you very much. And I hope that you enjoyed today's webinar. Thank you, Monique. Thank you for the for the keynote and for providing us with an insight on what the focus group is doing. Uh, we will now move on to the next keynote, um, for which I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Anthony Ria, who's the director of infrastructure department at WMO. Over to you. Thanks, thank, thanks, Michael. I hope you can hear me well, uh, and uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to to speak today. And uh, good good day, good good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's who's participating. I might I might start with a disclaimer, and that is that I'm not an expert on AI. Uh, however, I have spent the last thirty years working with uh, environmental and, and meteorological, climate, hydrological data of different types, and as we well know data as the raw material for artificial intelligence. And so I, I want to sort of set the scene a little bit and maybe lay the table uh, in terms of uh, what, what WMO is doing in terms of uh, provision of, of data, in particular for, for the prediction uh, and understanding of, of natural disasters. Um, and uh, then uh, talk a little bit, I think, with that context, then talk a little bit about uh, how AI can, can fit into that into that puzzle, and I think I'll echo quite a few of the things that Monique's already said in her uh, in her presentation. So, WMO is a specialised agency of the United Nations, and its mission is to to facilitate the worldwide cooperation in the design and delivery of meteorological services, uh, foster the rapid exchange of, of meteorological, climate, and water information, uh, advance the standardisation of data build cooperation between services, encourage research and training, and expand the use of meteorology to benefit other sectors like agricultural aviation and so on. So this, the scope of WMO uh, spans weather, climate, uh, hydrological, and related environmental phenomena, and you know, including things like, uh, like space weather, for example. So how do we handle the detection and the forecasting and communication of natural hazards and the dark disasters? And how might AI play a role in, in that? Uh, it, this, isn't a green, it, this is not a greenfields area. So there's, a, there's huge global infrastructure, of course, that supports uh, 
the forecasts uh, that, that many of us take for granted, getting, getting on our phone uh, or whatever. And it's a data-driven exercise. So for, for weather and climate, there's a huge global infrastructure that leads to, to the, 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 the provision of weather forecasts, uh, data from uh, uh, many, um, and, and also underpinning things like seasonal prediction and even uh, long-term climate predictions. And, and this infrastructure includes data from, from satellites, from uh, weather stations, from weather balloons, from aircraft, from ships, from drifting buoys, and from systems uh, below the surface of the ocean uh, like Argo. And this, uh, this measures the pulse of the planet in, in real time, and this data is exchanged in real time. And if you think about this, it's actually quite an impressive achievement. And it is something that's existed sort of since the 1950s and, uh, and perhaps even before, you know, there, there was a real-time data exchange sort of as soon as, uh, as, soon as radio and telegraph were, were invented. So this data feeds into a relatively small number of global producing centres that are predominantly located in the met services of uh, the wealthiest countries. And that's because the operation of these huge uh, exascale computers is, is very expensive. It consumes uh, as much power as, uh, as a, small, a small town and, uh, and, and it requires a very specialised technical and scientific workforce. So for that reason, there's only about 12 of these global producing centres um, across the planet. And these provide the forecasts out to seven to 10 days that are used by absolutely everyone on the planet. Absolutely everyone depends on this infrastructure, every single person. Uh, so, so understanding that, uh, how can AI play, play a role given that we've got all of this and we don't, we don't want to kind of replicate it? Um, weather and climate modeling does a, does a good job uh, without AI and the, and the skill and the the range, and what I mean by the range is how many days in the future can we predict? It's improving all the time, and you know we can look at various statistics that you know uh, a, a, a five-day forecast now is as good as a three-day forecast was a decade ago, and so on. So it's this continual uh, improvement, um, and there's a tendency, I think, in the in the AI community to think about it as as a, a magic bullet or a magic solution. But uh, I'll make this point, I think I made it last year as well, that in situations where we understand the physics well and we can model it uh, in a physical way, we'll always do a better job than, than, than AI. So we've got to think about, uh, as we might say in Australia, horses for courses or, or, or what, what's the best place where we get the biggest uh, impact in terms of the application of AI across the value chain. So one, as Monique has mentioned already, is detection of natural hazards. And AI and machine vision can uh, clearly provide a, an additional set of eyes on, on the data. So as you can imagine, I talked about this real-time infrastructure, there's a huge amount of data coming in and, and it's getting to the point where actually a human forecaster can't deal with all of the data that might be coming from uh, rapid, rapid update models, from satellites, from radar, from weather stations. And this is where AI and decision support systems can play an incredibly important role in terms of understanding all of that data that's coming in and perhaps uh, flagging when there might be an anomaly or where it detects that there, there, there may be a need to, let's say, issue a warning for a severe thunderstorm or something like that. So I think that's, that's a clear role. And in some cases, uh, it, for some countries, that's about augmenting the role of a, of a human forecaster in some cases, it will be the replacement of, of, of a person with, with a system that's generating warnings automatically. At least I think that's where the technology is, is going. Uh, and we're starting to see uh, a similar application in, in other areas outside of meteorology. And I'm thinking about uh, volcanoes, volcanism, for example. So we can, we can see that uh, AI might be able to look at uh, uh, deformation of the surface, whether that's mentioned measured in situ or by uh, synthetic aperture radar satellites and, and make some kind of prediction about uh, volcanic eruptions, which has never been able to be done before. So I think that's a very exciting area. Perhaps, perhaps another area might be in terms of integrating new types of data yeah, into the global system and particularly data from the Internet of Things where the quality is not tightly controlled in the way that we might control data from a, from a weather station, let's say, but the sheer number of observations can be used to collectively sort of drive down the, the noise in the system and, uh, 
and in terms of the pre-processing of observations for, for the models, this can also be applied uh, where we can maybe weed out those observations that might be biased or inaccurate that would perturb the forecast and make it less accurate going forward. But the biggest area, I think, and the biggest opportunity is in uh, understanding and modelling impact. So whether, as I already said, whether ocean climate models can do a, can do a good job of predicting what the weather is going to do, and, that, and that's important, that's the first step. But really, to, to, to get to value for, for, for people, we don't need to just understand what the weather is going to do, but what's the weather going to do to the people, to the environment, to, to the built environment. Um, so this is uh, this is really impact-based forecasting, and this is where I think uh, AI can play can play a huge role. So to really understand this, we need to be able to integrate data coming out of the global weather uh, infrastructure with other types of data, data on populations, on on health, on on the built environment, on uh, let's say the, the the state of a coral reef, for example, if we want to understand the impact on that, or agricultural data. Um, so AI can play a role in bringing these disparate types of data together and uncovering the hidden relationships, the correlations and, and the codependencies. So I'll close uh, by saying that uh, there, there are some key things that I think that, that I think we should collectively focus on. Uh, one of these is open data. So the WMO, we had an extraordinary congress uh, last year in October, and one of the things that was agreed uh, was a unified open data policy, unified data policy which spans uh, weather, climate, and, and water. Really, all of the all of the domains that WMO is is interested in. Um, and uh, and uh, that, that that defines. Uh, core data, which we're calling core data, as, as the data that is required to underpin that, that global system. And core data under the policy, and this was agreed by 193 members of WMO, is freely uh, available and, and in an unrestricted way. So it's available to, obviously, to all of the MET services globally, all of the hydrological services, but it's also open to private sector, it's also open to research. And so we firmly believe that the, the opening up of this data and making data available is the way to, to, drive, uh, to, to drive value and to, to drive uh, innovation in the global system. Uh, and we need to push for the opening up of data from other domains uh, so that we can get to that goal that I was talking about before in terms of, in terms of impact. So, it's fine to have all of the meteorological data available, but we really need to be pushing for data on, on the built environment, uh, new types of environmental data that's not globally exchanged, like, like even many types of hydrological data, for example. Uh, so we do need to continue to push to, to make more and more data available. And if we do that, that's going to that's drive that innovation in, in artificial intelligence and other fields. Uh, interoperability. So, so many, many AI projects, many data projects burn up uh, a lot of resources on data curation and preparation. So some estimates have this at 90% of the effort in any given data project is, is about curating and preparing the data so that then you can actually spend 10% of your time uh, doing the experiment. We need to kind of flip that around uh, and make it so that, you know, you spend 10% of the time on curation and 90% of the time on the actual research and delivering the value. But this requires a, a lot of effort and, you know, we need to really push hard to drive interoperability. That includes formats, but it also includes things like vocabularies and ontologies and so that so that when we're when we're talking about a variable in one data set from the meteorological field let's say that, that it's it's compatible and interoperable with that, 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 we, that we're talking the same language uh, essentially and then maybe the, the the last thing that i'll say is uh avoiding you know the kind of temptation to jump into what i would call vertically integrated solutions and we see this a lot uh in in the meteorological space where there's some kind of great innovation in terms of uh, observing systems or, or technology. Um, one example might be, let's say, there's a, there's a private company that's gathering data, I don't know, on uh, 
on, uh, on, on pressure observations from mobile phones or something, and then they think it's a great idea to vertically integrate down to a to an app-based solution that delivers a delivers a forecast uh, to someone's phone. I'm not saying that's happening, but that, that, that's the kind of thing that we see, this kind of temptation to, to just take one data set and then vertically integrate down to a service delivery, kind of ignoring what that thing I talked about before, that, that billions of, of dollars of global investment in, uh, in global infrastructure. So I think, to, to me, uh, that, it's, it's really about uh, understanding, well, two things. I'll, I'll say two things and I'll finish. Uh, I think we need to push globally for, for more data to be opened up, for the interoperability of data to be, to be a real, real focus, and then to avoid the temptation to use AI to replicate things that are already working, working very well. So I think it's about finding the sweet spots in the value chain where, where we can that we can apply apply AI. And for me, that's about uh, at the start of the chain for us, you know, uh, maybe uh, filtering and, and doing some quality control and observations. And then at really at the at the impact end, bringing together data from different domains and uh, and, and using that to drive uh, better decision making. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking and uh, and hand you back to to Michael. So thank you, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Dr. Ria. Thank you for the insightful remarks and for emphasizing on the importance of open data. Uh, within this domain. Uh, we highly appreciate your presence uh, today's webinar. We, before we move on to the third keynote, uh, I would like to thank all our participants who have connected um, through the neural network to this. I'm told that we have over 300 participants connected at the moment. So thank you all. And I hope you stay tuned for uh, the exciting presentations we have coming up. Uh, so for the third keynote, I would like to give the floor to Professor Catherine Wheeler from the University of Edinburgh School of Geosciences. Over to you. Thank you very much. I hope you can see my screen. Somebody able to confirm that? Yes, 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 we can. I'm trying to go into full screen mode. There we go. That should be in full screen mode now, hopefully. Yes, it's perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, my name is Cathy Whaler and I'm here because I'm the president of the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics, um, which obviously deals with many of the um, topics under consideration here. Now this we call our organogram, but it's really a horrendogram. And this is showing how we're structured, which I thought might be useful. So we have associations at the top here, um, covering the various science areas. And you'll see that they, structure themselves to look at individual topics within there and also they provide services and products and they endorse those things for the community um, and at the bottom we have some cross-cutting commissions and working groups some of them are cross-cutting amongst ourselves and some of them are outward facing and the one that's obviously of particular interest here is the geophysical risk and sustainability commission what's not shown on this slide is our outward connections as well, including liaisons with many of the UN um, groupings, including WMO. So I've picked out here now the logos of the science areas that we cover, and I'm going to try and give you a few examples of the use of AI in these science areas. Not all of them because of the time. So we are interested in cryospheric sciences, in geodesy, which is the shape of the earth, in geomagnetism, hydrology, meteorology and atmospheric sciences, the oceans, particularly the physical sciences, but also covering some of the chemistry, seismology and volcanology. I, of course, I'm not going to be able to go through all of these, but I'll pick out some examples and then I've got a, a couple of concluding remarks. So here's an example in the seismology area, looking at big data. And the, uh, this is a study that's funded and, and undertaken in Japan, where obviously um, is one of the areas where they suffer very badly from the impacts of devastating earthquakes. And this is an idea of using AI guided by what we have learned over the years and human intelligence to understand earthquakes better. <clears throat> so this example uses synthetic and real data to train a CNN to detect what we call slow earthquakes. These are the, the ruptures that proceed a lot more slowly, but it can still be very, very devastating. And the example is shown down here. 
the, what we call the subduction zone of Japan, where we have one plate um, pro plunging beneath another one. And this is known to cause many earthquakes, including the one that impacted on the nuclear power plant um, over a decade ago now. So the slow earthquakes are this sort of intermediate depth ones that you can see shown here. <clears throat> and they are responsible for a lot of the, the hazard. And then, of course, we also know that earthquakes are associated with a number of aftershocks, and there's also been some um, work done on AI under this program shown here to understand and model aftershocks. And this is in using, in some cases, data assimilation. So uh, looking at slow earthquakes, looking at aftershocks, particularly in the context of the large and devastating earthquakes in Japan, um, is one very clear application of AI. And I thought I would also think a little bit more about how it's relevant to disaster management, because this allows us, the use of AI allows us to improve detection, to identify the type or the mechanism of an earthquake, uh, which is one of the things that will, for instance, determine whether it's likely to generate a tsunami, it will enable more accurate location, estimate of magnitude or the strength of that earthquake, and the propensity to generate after, after the shocks. So there's a huge amount of work going on in seismology um, relevant to disasters and hazards associated with earthquakes and tsunami. We've already had mention earlier today of uh, numerical weather prediction. An example I'm going to show you is an application to determine the probability of excessive rainfall events. And it's from the US where they've broken the US up into eight regions and looks at a variety of candidate predictors for a weather protection model. And they've trained the model on 10 years worth of uh, reforecast ensembles and used a random forest machine learning algorithm to determine the most important predictive variable and then validated the results. So here's an example, the eight regions that I've um, uh, shown here, and we're seeing the predictor variables from days two in blue and three in red. And you can see that for most areas, precipitation frequency is the most important predictor, but in convectively active regions, the uh, water uh, vapor available is, is um, a very strong um, an important feature of the AI system. And they showed here that the Briar skill is better on days two and three, whereas the native model that they were using before, rather than the machine learning model, works better on day one. And here in yellow is the native model showing how it deteriorates on days two and days three. And these um, machine learning models are now used as a first guess for excessive rainfall. <clears throat> Other examples of machine learning in atmospheric sciences, there are many, I've just highlighted a few here. One is hail prediction, determination of the best ensemble members for short term, by which I mean zero to three hours sort of storm tracks, that are associated or overlap with a tornado or a severe event, hail event or strong winds. Another application is what detecting what the uh, meteorologists call comma-shaped clouds, and the uh, name is, includes the name there. And these are associated with severe storms, and they can be detected from satellite images using AI. And also, again, using satellite data, automatic bolide or bright meteor detection as part of the looking at the threat from meteorites um, and meteors from space. <clears throat> so hydrology has been developing alongside AI um, over a number of years now. So the early applications were associated with looking at uh, the flow of water, rainfall, and water quality. And in those days, the applications were limited to being uh, able, enabling prediction at a point. Now, of course, things are much more sophisticated. So there are bigger and more diverse data sets, much greater computing power, new algorithms that are in being employed, such as support vector regression, random forest, boosting algorithms, and deep learning. And these have been applied to uh, going beyond point predictions and forecasting. For example, looking at the runoff from rainfall, 
looking at post-processing applications, particularly in the probabilistic predictions, spatio-temporal applications using remote sensing, and AI for identifying and explaining relationships in big data sets. So very much an emphasis on big data in the hydrological applications. And new problems to be tackled or to be solved are associated with the predictions of extremes. We're now very good at dealing with the day-to-day, -day, but uh, when it comes to extremes, the less common events, there are still a number of challenges. And um, this previous speaker already talked about this, generating adversarial networks, i.e. simulating and using big data in these kind of applications. Here's another example. This is for soil moisture. If we know the soil moisture, then we're much more able to, uh, likely to be able to forecast the flooding more accurately. So here you can see examples here for um, a low set of locations shown in the US at various percentiles ranked by correlation coefficient between the AI model and the satellite observations. So you can look at here at the training success, uh, sorry, the training and then followed it with the testing uh, to see that these AI algorithms are really performing quite well in the majority of the cases. And it's not necessarily um, very strongly correlated by the ranked percentiles of the correlation coefficient. I should say that NOAA is a, um, a land surface model, LSTM, is our machine algorithm, uh, machine learning algorithm, and then the um, autoregressive model as shown here by the various line types. And this is an example now of hind casting. So we train with current time, and then we go back in the past to see how we can do there. And this is by adding noise to this NOAA data set I just mentioned as the target, and then trying to do a proof of concept using, again, the LSTM and the autoregression to uh, do the hind casting experiment. So you can see that, in fact, the autoregressive overshoots the peaks in this prediction here. This is a particular pixel, um, whereas the LSTM does really a little bit better. And here we're looking at the root mean square error in our success here for again LSTM and the autoregressions, showing again that the error is lower for the LSTM model. This is an example with 7% noise added and they looked at other uh, noise levels to see how the performance was. <clears throat> so my own interest is in space weather um, and geomagnetism in general. And this is an area, again, that's been mentioned in a previous speaker that is actually not recognized until recently because we've become so technologically dependent. So you see on the video here, an event from the sun impinging on the earth, altering our sort of protective magnetic shield and injecting lots of energetic particles into um, the, the environment around the earth, leading to this phenomenon that we, we see, the northern and the southern lights, but also a huge amount of um, hazard that we need to deal with. So there's power blackouts, disruption, transformer damage, geomagnetically induced currents in ground infrastructure, like you know, this affects things like train signaling and co corrosion of pipelines, uh, positioning satellites, loss of lock and timing, and things that depend on them. So um, obviously missiles, when you're trying to track them to see if they've been shot down or, or not, um, and this is very current at the moment, of course. Uh, if you lose the lock because of a space weather event, then that obviously is, is a, of great concern. Excess radiation doses for astronauts and in, in fact for the crews of high altitude planes and satellite damage. And satellites become buffeted by the solar wind and this impacts on the fuel budget to restore the orbits. Um, and a couple of examples, in March 1989, Quebec, Canada lost all its power for several days, and this was in the winter, this is in March. Um, we'll look at the um, what's known as the Halloween storm event from the time of year it happened, when 47 satellites um, reported malfunctions, and some can, have been permanently damaged. 
Sorry, I'm trying to go on to the next slide. There are various drivers of space weather um, from the sun, what, what are known as coronal mass ejections, solar storms and substorms, and the impacts of them on, the, on and near the Earth depends on a number of factors. And how and the extent to which the field, the geomagnetic field is disturbed by these solar events are characterized by a number of geomagnetic indices. And a lot of the effort has been going into forecasting them for assessing the possible effects of space weather events. But if we're going to look at geomagnetically induced currents, we also need to forecast the ground magnetic field and its rate of change. And so the inputs for this type of modeling are geomagnetic indices, measuring the extent of disturbance, measures of the solar energy, solar wind parameters, interplanetary magnetic field observations, and as I'll show you an example in a moment, physics-based models as well. So this is, in fact, um, an example here in the center. We've got the output of a physics-based model on the right, the output of a neural network model, and on the left, the assimilative code. And here we've got a time series of two of these geomagnetic indices that I was mentioning. KP, when it gets large, denotes a geomagnetic storm. DST, when it drops, again, is associated with a, with a geomagnetic storm. And we look at these um, model outputs in terms of what we call local time. So here's midnight, here's midday. So the sun is off to the left, uh, dawn and dusk. And we're just looking at one of the parameters for these models that are characterizing what's going on here. So you can see the evolution in time there and the assimilative code showing the actual results of the two. And I'll see if I can go on to there. And so here's the output of one of those looking actually at the data for the KP index and in red, the machine learning model result for it. And this is the prediction during what we call the Halloween storm in um, late 2003. And KP is really important. It's a planetary geomagnetic index. It's used to determine when power grid supply problems may occur, when satellite upsets or anomalies may occur, and to calculate the satellite drag and determine time and location of re-entry. And, and just to give you an example of another one that I've not shown, there's another index, AP, which is used to decide launch or no launch of satellites. So again, forecasting that is, is really important. Um, and this is an example of an attempt to forecast the ground magnetic field and its rate of change. You can see I'm running out of time, so I'll probably skip the details of this, but we're looking at now pass the forecast of the field itself and um, looking of the end of the rate of change of the field. And this black line is the one-to-one -one correlation, which would mean that our forecast or our prediction is perfect. And then the orange and the blue lines are various AI models, which don't do as well. So there's a number of challenges in that area. Now, um, I was going to try to talk a little bit about landslides because IUG is supporting the Kyoto landslide commitment 2020 and many geophysical phenomena are caused by landslides but I think in in light of time I shall move on towards the end. Um, the previous example that I've not had time to show you is actually from a special issue of computer and geosciences in 2018 uh, which look at big data and natural disasters and it's got a number of case studies we covering besides the landslide slide example there floods, earthquakes, tsunami, and volcanic eruptions. So just a couple of slides to conclude with. Um, there's a final side note I wanted to say. It's important not to consider disasters in isolation. For example, in September 2017, there were two Caribbean storms, Irma, or hurricanes, in fact, Irma and Jose, and they coincided with a space weather event affecting GNSS locations and satellite communications. So for instance, um, satellite um, phones were not working well. You couldn't get accurate locations because of the upsets caused by the space weather event. And mitigation and management strategies may need to consider these interacting and cascading impacts, not just these, but any. And it's not clear to me what the role of AI is under these circumstances. So thank you very much for listening. And I would like to encourage you to join us for our next General Assembly in Berlin, which will take place next year 
when all kinds of science will be discussed, but it, this will definitely include a number of applications of artificial intelligence, mean, machine learning, and big data to the kinds of problems that we're interested in and looking at the applications. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Wheeler, and thank you for the invitation to your General Assembly as well. Um, so we will now move on to the last keynote of today's webinar, for which I would like to pass the floor for, to Professor David Hidget, who is the Vice President of the Asia Oceania Geosciences Society. So over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'll just um, attempt to share my screen. Uh, hopefully that is now displaying. Uh, my name is David Higgett. Um, I was the president of Asia Osea on the Geosciences Society uh, from 2018 to 2020. Uh, I'm now the exiting uh, vice president. Um, in case you're wondering what, what a British academic is doing uh, in charge of, of this society for Asia and Oceania, uh, I have been based out in Asia for the past 20 years or so, uh, initially at National University of Singapore uh, and more recently in China. Uh, my current uh, day job, uh, the one that pays my salary, uh, is to run uh, a campus in China uh, for Lancaster University in our collaboration with Beijing uh, Jiao Tong University. However, because of current travel restrictions, I'm actually currently doing that remotely uh, from the UK. So I'm, I'm joining you uh, from the north of England uh, this morning. Now, I was asked uh, to uh, introduce uh, Asia Oceania Geoscience Society. Uh, I, I suspect that that a number of you um, taking part in today's webinar uh, are not familiar with this society. So my, my main uh, remit was to uh, introduce you to the nature of, of this society and just to say a little bit uh, about our interest in AI related uh, research on natural hazards. Uh, I'm going to indulge you with an example of my own uh, field-based research, which is not grounded in, in AI applications, uh, but rather to set the challenge of how do we integrate some of the field-based observations that we have uh, in Asian environments uh, with the potential of AI uh, to uh, enhance uh, the uh, applicability uh, of this work. Uh, I'm also um, have to confess I'm not an expert uh, in uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I could claim to be a stakeholder uh, in the sense that as a leader uh, of a scientific society, uh, we are encouraging our, our members to put forward uh, conference sessions relating uh, to uh, the applications of AI, particularly uh, applications towards the uh, enhancement of disaster uh, mitigation. Uh, we're there to uh, encourage our members to collaborate uh, with each other uh, and indeed across international uh, boundaries to collaborate with, with other organizations as well. So uh, Asia Oceania Geosciences Society is a broad-based geosciences society with eight scientific sections uh, established in 2003, uh, based out of, of Singapore where our secretariat uh, is located. Uh, and its broad mission is to promote geoscience and its application uh, for the benefit of humanity. Noting, of course, that uh, it's sitting in a region where uh, countries are particularly vulnerable uh, to natural hazards. Primarily, AOGS is a platform for sharing and disseminating uh, geosciences research, uh, primarily uh, through annual conventions. And we cooperate a lot with other uh, larger geosciences society with AGU, EGU, JPGU. Uh, we also cooperate with IUGG. So nice to see uh, Kathy's uh, talk immediately ahead of this. Um, what we're not trying to do is we're not trying to be an Asian version of AGU. We're much smaller. Uh, we're a, really a, a bottom up society uh, created by scientists for scientists. Uh, we don't have any uh, affiliation to any government body or any real kind of political lobbying power. Uh, we, we, we do what our, our, our membership uh, ask us to do, um, but we do that um, with the aim 
of creating benefit uh, for humanity. Currently have about 13,000 members. Um, typically our, our meetings are successful in attracting uh, contributors from the Asian region. So a 2019 meeting here, uh, about 80% uh, of our participants are, are coming from uh, Asian countries, um, but it is a truly international meeting. Um, we have a lot of tie-ups with uh, other geosciences uh, societies. Um, we were going to have the largest ever meeting in 2020. Uh, this is our council uh, visiting Korea, uh, planning uh, an event that would have attracted four to 5,000 people. Uh, unfortunately, like many other societies, uh, we fell victim uh, to the pandemic. Uh, fortunately, um, we managed to avoid uh, significant financial loss, uh, which of course is, is very important for relatively small societies that, that are, are self-funding. Um, but we have lost some momentum. Uh, we're currently operating a, a virtual meeting in 2022. Um, that was on the back of, of, a, of a really good uh, momentum over the last 10 years or so. If I add an arrow to this slide, uh, you can see our, our conference sizes have, have been going up steadily uh, through the last few years. We operate a model where Singapore is our home base. So every other year, uh, we have the convention in Singapore, uh, and then we go out uh, around the region. Um, so we've been to, to many different countries uh, in Asia and Australasia. Um, we can see that upward trend that is really indicating that there's, there's confidence that this is a useful uh, meeting uh, for scientists to collaborate. I'd like to think that that, that trend is actually mirrored uh, by the, the rise uh, of uh, Asian power in the sense that if we look at, at, at um, GDP data, we can see uh, the um, significance of, of our meeting matched by uh, the, the rise in GDP. Uh, in 2020, the World Economic Forum had predicted uh, that Asia's GDP would overtake uh, the rest of the world combined. I'm not sure whether that, that happened in light of the pandemic, uh, but clearly this is a, this is a major uh, growth area. And that's mirrored also uh, in research expenditure. So Asian research is very much uh, on the ascendancy. Uh, the, there's been breakthroughs into the world university rankings. 26 Asian universities are now in the top uh, 100 uh, globally uh, and challenging uh, the domination of um, UK and American universities for sure. Uh, that's matched, of course, by availability of research funding, particularly in China, uh, where R&D expenditure has uh, accelerated very significantly. However, there are obviously negative impacts of such rapid growth. Um, one of those is inequality, increasing gaps between the rich and the poor countries uh, within uh, the uh, Asian continent, uh, and very much so uh, uh, not just um, not just between countries, but within those countries. Uh, so here, geoscience has, has a contribution uh, to work towards uh, the uh, reduction of inequalities, uh, particularly the way that inequality uh, is associated with uh, exposure uh, to hazard risk. Natural hazards, very high prevalence in Asia, uh, but very uneven uh, exposure to risk. Uh, UN data suggests, for example, for flood uh, displacements, uh, that um, within the last couple of decades, uh, probably more than 90% of people displaced by flood events are, are people residing in Asia. As an, as an organization, um, we obviously we're, we're keen to encourage our members uh, to um, share uh, their hazard research uh, in our conventions, but we've teamed up with the European uh, Geoscience Union uh, to create a, a new series of, of events on natural hazards. It's the AOGS EGU joint conference series on new dimensions uh, for natural hazards in Asia. Um, we started in 2018 with a, with a, a real meeting uh, in the Philippines. We've since done uh, a couple of virtual events and we're hoping to uh, take this, this further uh, probably next year. Um, that event 
we've done it in a very different format from a, a regular conference. So it, it's very much focused around uh, discussions and, and panels and collaborations. Uh, and um, we'd like to think that it's uh, uh, making a contribution to uh, collaboration and uh, the development of new uh, research ideas. Now, um, our members are putting up um, many examples of research using AI, but I'm, I wanted to uh, come to uh, an example of a, a major hazard event. Uh, I've, I've been doing some work related to this, but uh, it's not work that's, that uh, is, is using uh, AI applications. Um, but I think this is a, an example that, that Cathy was also uh, going to talk about uh, where uh, there's huge potential for, for AI uh, to help us manage different aspects of uh, earthquake and landslide related events. Uh, so this is a map uh, of the Wenchuan uh, earthquake uh, 2008 in, in Sichuan province in, in China. Uh, this earthquake um, uh, ruptured uh, in uh, Yingshu uh, on the uh, south uh, west corner of this, this map. Uh, the fault zone uh, ruptured towards the northeast. Uh, the map is indicating density uh, of landslides that are mapped from, from satellites soon afterwards. Uh, the, the core area, more than 10% of land surfaces uh, were, dis were disturbed. Uh, this generated huge numbers of small uh, landslide dams. And um, I'll show you a picture in a moment, uh, a little bit further north outside this zone. Uh, but one of the features uh, of this earthquake was the huge quantities of sediments released by rock slides, landslides, uh, and debris flows uh, that buried roads and raised the elevation of riverbeds significantly, in some cases, up to 30 meter uh, increase in elevation. Uh, now, at the time, um, uh, this was described as unprecedented. There was very little uh, in the uh, literature to suggest that these uh, amounts of, of sediment influx have been observed previously, a little in the historical record to suggest that it had been noted uh, from past events. So among the key questions, and I say among because there are obviously lots of pressing questions about um, uh, disaster prevention. Uh, one of the issues here is how uh, sediments that are, are, are generated uh, in these events, how those themselves contribute to a cascade of further hazards over months and years uh, as that sediment is remobilized and moved further down uh, the hydrological system. Um, and since it was described as unprecedented, is there actually evidence of older catastrophic events? Can we find field evidence in the sedimentary record uh, that these kind of things have happened before? Um, so as a geomorphologist, I went off looking uh, for such evidence. Um, here we can find in quarries, we can find some evidence of uh, sediments which have been uh, buried subsequently, uh, but indicate, uh, I've got some preliminary dates here, indicate that, that there was certainly an event which blocked this valley and accumulated sediment. Now let's move down to the Yangtze River. Again, we're on an earthquake zone. We can see the yellow blobs here indicating uh, historical uh, major earthquakes. Uh, and we observed uh, in the valley, there's a sequence of small sand quarries, uh, relatively small quarries distributed here and there. Um, but the suggestion was that perhaps this represents sediments which have accumulated behind a river blocking dam. We've subsequently done lots of field work in, in the valley. Uh, we've established preliminary dates. That this event happened 60,000 years ago around here, around the town of, of uh, uh, and from that, we've been able to reconstruct the uh, deposit uh, of the sediments uh, and work out where, where the landslide uh, occurred. So this is a huge event, a dam height of around 200 meters, a, a, a lake which is over 100 kilometers long um, and, and blocking a, a massive uh, river. Oh, excuse me. Now, uh, actually looking for the evidence of the landslide is really difficult. Um, so as a, as a field geomorphologist, you, you'd expect you'd be able to see uh, evidence of a massive landslide uh, quite easily uh, in the landscape. 
But this is an event that happened 60,000 years ago. So this is not something that is immediately obvious. And in fact, when we turn to data visualization uh, from uh, geographical information systems, we can start to, to get some clues. So something relatively simple, we've, we've mapped the aspect of the valley slopes and we start to see some anomalies. We can extract slope profiles and we can start to see that we've got some evidence of a, of a, of a large landslide bowl, which you can't really see from looking at it in, in the landscape very clearly. Uh, we can start to play around with digital elevation models and identify uh, potential ramparts of, of where this landslide sediment crossed the river at and accumulated. So my challenge uh, for AI is here's something that started with a field investigation, looking at sediments, mapping them out. Um, we get some clues from data visualization. Here we have an example uh, combining field investigation with data visualization. Is the potential for AI to recognize these paleo hazards which are hiding in plain sight? Uh, we know that, that paleo hazards are in incredibly important. Understanding the dimensions, the magnitude of, of past hazards really helps us to understand the range uh, of, of possible events that, that would occur. Um, but they've been somewhat understudied, uh, partly because the evidence is fragmentary. I think we have a real opportunity here uh, to think about how we might uh, automate uh, the finding uh, of uh, some of these sites. Um, more broadly, uh, for AOGS, um, we're seeing lots of examples now uh, of AI applications in prediction, monitoring, early warning systems, damage mitigation, uh, disaster response. Uh, the ASG, AOGS community is embracing uh, these techniques uh, and uh, reporting them uh, at our, our, our meetings, uh, particularly strong in hydrological sciences. There's a, quite a long tradition uh, of using neural networks in, in, in modeling, which uh, that is built on, uh, particularly strong in our atmospheric science uh, community, uh, which does uh, a lot of work in forecasting, particularly uh, looking at, at typhoon hazards and so on. Uh, so I think um, this is a, an organization where we, we're going to encourage uh, more involvement uh, from the community working in AI. And I strongly uh, encourage uh, people here today to, to get involved with us. Uh, and by all means, contact me if you'd like to know a little bit more about what's going on. Um, this year we're virtual. Next year, fingers crossed, uh, we'll be back as a, as a real meeting and it will be our uh, 20th uh, anniversary. Uh, and we're very keen to, to put on a, a good show for that uh, and uh, get our our new dimensions on natural hazard series uh, back up uh, as a physical event, uh, probably in Indonesia sometime in 2023 or 2024. Okay, so I think my time is, uh, is probably up by now. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop sharing my screen and um, finish there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Higgett. Thank you for your uh, keynote and thank you for providing an overview of the work of the AOGS and for inviting us to your subsequent meetings as well. Uh, we will now close the keynote session and we will commence session two. For this, I would like to call upon the session two chair, Mr. Andrea Toretti, who's a senior scientist and scientific officer at the European Commission. So over to you, Andrea. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Midili, and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, second uh, uh, session of uh, the event on uh, AI for uh, uh, forecasting and uh, projections. So it's my uh, pleasure to uh, give the floor to the first speaker of this uh, session from the University of Amsterdam, Anais Kuznan. Uh, so Anais, the floor is, uh, is yours. Thank you very much. I'll just be uh, sharing my screen and start the presentation mode. So a little bit slow. Did this work? Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, oops, that went too far, sorry. <laughs> Hi everybody, um, thank you very much for inviting me today uh, to present some of the work uh, done jointly with um, colleagues at the IBM, so jointly with Timothy Tichelofer 
uh, and in close collaboration with Kim van Straat, uh, Dr. Senemais, and Professor Ward. Uh, for this session, uh, I've been asked to um, talk about exploring deep learning capabilities for storm surge prediction in coastal areas. Um, so I've kept this presentation uh, quite uh, broad, uh, but the, our findings have now been published in an open access uh, publication. And I'll put the link at the end of this presentation. So if you want more technical content, I invite you to come and have a look, no, or of course, uh, contact me or ask some questions at the end. Uh, so why uh, storm surge prediction in uh, coastal areas? Um, so I think uh, this morning um, we had some great introductions about why uh, natural hazard management is vital. Uh, and I would say the coast is often an area that is uh, frequently hit uh, by different type of hazards. Here we focused on storm surges, uh, but uh, you can understand just by, for example, looking at the night light uh, image uh, that the coast has uh, very high concentrations of population assets, um, uh, yeah, activities. And so for this, uh, coastal adaptation and coastal management is uh, vital. Uh, and so usually this is done, uh, so this is why data is so important. Uh, and so the problem is that if we look at gauge observations, so you see here an image uh, using um, Gessler 2 data sets, which is um, stations for, uh, that are measuring total, um, that are measuring sea level at different temporal resolution. Uh, there's quite a lot of, of uh, gauges, even though some parts of the posts uh, are, are left out. Um, one major challenge is also a lot of those uh, stations do not have a lot of data. Um, and this often we need a lot of this data to understand those coastal environment to plan and to mitigate for this. If I just give the example of um, predicting extremes, which was also discussed, uh, we often need a time record of 25 years to be able to make robust assessment about extremes. Uh, and as you can see in the histogram at the lower left uh, on the screen, most of the stations do not have a uh, long enough uh, time record to, to, um, to assess those um, robustly for those extremes. Um, so to, to basically fill in those gaps, um, what's very often done is to model coastal conditions. And I wanted to explain uh, here just a little bit of the jargon uh, because I imagine there is quite a different uh, crowd um, so to model those fluctuation in uh, sea level or just the sea level, uh, we have to understand those uh, and model those different processes. Um, so part of this fluctuation, which is, uh, is, is from the tides, so high tide and low tide, and that's often seen as a deterministic signal because uh, it is from the attraction between uh, the earth and the moon. Uh, but there is an additional component, the storm surge, uh, which you see in red uh, here, and that's uh, linked with atmospheric conditions. So uh, when you have a drop in, um, pressures, uh, in pressure and also strong winds that will push the water along the coast. On top of that, you have um, also very uh, high uh, temporal um, frequency from wind waves, um, but uh, given the, for our study, we, we did, did not look on, on the fluctuations of those, uh, from those wind waves. And so traditionally at the global uh, scale, uh, this has been done either from physically based models or really hydrodynamic model. For example, here you see uh, the grid of such uh, model with different resolution, so more resolution along the coast. Um, but uh, recently um, more and more data-driven methods uh, have appeared uh, to try to uh, predict uh, storm surge uh, at different temporal resolution. And the idea here is that both those models need a lot of uh, data, uh, but when we're looking into physically based model where we have to reproduce certain processes, um, we need certain type of data that may not be available everywhere uh, along the globe. Whereas with um, data driven models, we can use a proxy for those processes. Um, and so with this, we can try to understand those relationships. And so very briefly, um, recently, there's been quite a lot of effort in the coastal area at the global scale, uh, looking into data-driven effort for storm surges. Um, I've highlighted three here. Um, so uh, they've basically used different machine learning techniques, uh, mainly principal component analysis to look at storm surge level prediction at a daily time step. This had been reused afterwards, um, also in combination with linear regression, random forests, 
um, with the, uh, again, looking at daily storm surges. And very recently, um, for the first uh, time, at least to, to my knowledge, um, using deep learning, so using artificial neural network, um, they also looked at um, hourly uh, storm surge prediction, which is, um, yeah, an advance compared to daily storm surge uh, predictions. And so when we were reviewing this with my colleagues, we knew that from other fields, and some of those methods have been introduced by the other speaker this morning, and that there are other deep learning methods. So for example, in hydrology, LSTM, which look into temporal dependencies is uh, very frequent. Uh, whereas in climate sciences or atmospheric sciences, CNN, convolutional neural network, which look at, let's say, patterns of certain weather types is, is very common. So we thought, is there some potential in there? Um, this, this had not been tested yet. And we also noticed when reading all this different literature um, that even though the choice of the predictor variables, so the input variables to feed the model uh, is often uh, from atmospheric variables, the number of them is very different depending on the studies and also the spatial extent around which we want to predict um, the storm surge varies depending on studies. So, so here again, there was um, yeah, very many differences and we wanted to know well, what, it, what is uh, considered as enough information to feed uh, the data, the, the model or to train the model? Is less more or is more just better? So to set this up, um, we looked at four different neural network types, um, artificial neural networks, so the ANN, CNN, LSTM, and the convolutional LSTM. Um, and we selected as uh, input variables, so our predictor variables, uh, atmospheric variables, because we were interested into the climate-driven uh, storm surge uh, variation. And this was uh, very standard, also looking at uh, previous um, papers. So often uh, one will look at the mean sea level pressure because we know during um, high storm surge events, there will be a drop of this mean sea level pressure. So we also looked at the gradient in this mean sea level pressure and also some uh, variables looking at uh, wind characteristics. And so for each of those neural network types, we tried as much as possible because there are differences to keep a similar um, uh, architecture as much as possible. Um, and so we use those uh, input variables, um, then the different model layers, so the NN, CNN, LSTM, or convolutional LSTM, uh, fully collected layer, and then we use this to predict the storm surge level. One thing I would like to note here is that the storm surge level itself is not being measured. As I was saying, it's um, the gauges measure the total water level, which means that we had to extract this uh, from uh, the gauges. Um, that also means that if there are some error during this process, for example, some bias, that will of course affect the performance of the model. Now, come back to that. Um, um, we use this uh, setup um, multiple times, so in parallel for with, uh, each location, so that for each location, we had an ensemble of models predicting um, storm surges. Um, that also means that the performance metrics we used to look at the performance of the model had to be a uh, probabilistic one. So we use the CRPS, which averages the differences between the observed and the predicted uh, storm surge. You can see it in a deterministic way as the mean absolute error. Um, so it, it has a scale of uh, units of centimeters in this case. But because the surge variation can be very different across locations, we wanted to standardize this. So we scale this, um, this measure, so it became a percentage. Uh, just to make sure it's, uh, for example, if you have a one centimeter error for when you're trying to predict storm surge uh, variability of one meter, this is, uh, let's say, quite good. But this would not be the case if you're trying to do the same and you have a storm surge variability of three centimeters, then the error is actually, this one centimeter is much worse. Um, so when we, so, so this shows uh, the scale of the neural network. Um, it doesn't say which neural network it is. I'll show that in the next slide. Um, but uh, you can already see a very clear spatial pattern uh, where the model perform much better at higher uh, latitudes than uh, around the tropics. Uh, and this is because variability in the tropics is often of a few centimeters. So this was probably interpreted by the model as noise and it made it very difficult uh, to understand which uh, variables were the most important. Um, 
if we look at which model was the best, so from this uh, pattern I, I, I just showed before, uh, we see that the LSTM overall um, was uh, the best fitting uh, model. But I would like to add a word of caution here that uh, when we set up those models, we used uh, similar hyperparameter settings. Um, so we didn't do any local optimization. And later, uh, actually in our study, we saw that uh, if this local optimization was done um, yeah, locally, then you can have uh, different results. So in a way, there is no one size fits all model. Um, and finally, around which information is uh, better. Um, we picked certain locations here. Um, so on the x-axis, you can see the spatial footprints. So how much information do we consider around the location? Um, and on the y-axis, you can see the number of predictor variable we include. Um, so from only one predictor variables to seven. Um, the interesting thing you see here is if you just look at increasing number of predictor variables or just increasing the spatial footprint, uh, the performance increases, but not as much as if you consider both uh, at the same time. That being said, you also see that uh, the scale uh, of this um, it is different per location. Uh, and so in places where the model does not perform well, for example, in Honolulu or in Puerto Amuelas, um, there is some improvement, but in the end, the, the uh, model can just not capture what we're trying to predict here. So clearly there's something else going on at those locations, other processes maybe that need to be included. So the main takeaway um, from our studies is that uh, deep learning models are still in their uh, infancy. There's still a lot to do, and this was just a first, um, a first try. But to do this, we really need to have transparent and reproducible methods to be able to build upon our efforts. The selected performance metrics, in this case, the CRPS and the mean absolute error, should go hand in hand with the purpose of the model. In this case, it was not specifically for extremes, even though we saw that um, in places it could be used for extremes. Uh, and then both the, the selection of the input variable and the quantity of the data is important for um, model performance. Uh, yeah, I would like to thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, excellent uh, overview uh, and uh, for sharing with us uh, your, uh, uh, your results. Now we can move uh, to the second speaker of uh, this uh, session, Julia Gottfriedsen from uh, Aurora Tech. Uh, Julia, the floor uh, is uh, yours. Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. Um, one second to share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see my presentation. Hi, I'm really happy to be here today and also to meet so many fellow geoscientists. Uh, I have to say I'm a geoscientist by training and then diverged a bit and went into the software engineering and data science space. So really interesting talk so far and really awesome what you've all done. I'm now working at Orotech and I'll introduce some of the use cases we're working on um, right now. And our company tackles wildfires as the main problem. And wildfires cause up to 10% of global CO2 emissions. So it's a really, uh, it's also a, um, a driver for climate change and impacts humans, but also destroys ecosystem, destroys, destroys biomass. And um, as you all know, there are different types of wildfires. So there are wildfires that uh, burn regularly and um, are a part of an intact ecosystem, but then there are also prescribed burns. For example, if we think of soy agriculture, where the rainforest is uh, being destroyed um, to make more space for agriculture. Um, so our company was founded in 2018 as a spin-off from the Technical University of Munich. And today we've grown to a team of over 70 people all around the world. And our product at the moment integrates over 20 external satellite data sources from ESA, over Landsat, of Sentinel-2, 
um, with a focus on thermal infrared data so that we can pre provide the best wildfire monitoring system that's out there. Um, and our tool visualizes all the hotspot in real time all over the world. And we integrate and homogenize all those data sources, but we also develop our own satellite, which is in orbit right now. So we launched it in January 22. And our aim is to have a full constellation of 100 nanosatellites in orbit. Why is that? Because we realized with all the data sources we integrate now, there is a data gap in the afternoon. So when we want to visualize and monitor wildfires, we don't get data from all the existing sources in the afternoon. And our satellites focus on that. So we're closing uh, the data gap there. And this helps us to build better models, better um, risk models, better, better propagation models, but I will talk about this later. And I heard before that um, vertical integration can be dangerous, but this is exactly what we're doing. So we're doing everything from the um, data generation to the data pre-processing, engineering, through the modeling, and then the visualization in the morning for the end user. And I think that's, that's really interesting. And also to um, survey this whole pipeline um, yeah, it's, it's really cool and there's a lot of innovation going on and I'll show you an overview now. So when we talk about wildfire detection and monitoring, we have this whole life cycle. Before the fire burns, we have a risk model in place. During, uh, during the burn of the fire or during the hotspot, we have the detection of the uh, hotspot and then the monitoring on how the fire front evolves. And then afterwards, I just... Afterwards, we uh, also have the damage analysis to really see how much damage there was and how much biomass, for example, has been burned or how many properties are affected. Now I'm going to introduce some of the use cases and I decided to use a lot of pictures so you can see model output here and not too many um, technical slides, but about the fire risk model, for example, I'll be speaking at the ECMWF machine learning workshop in two weeks and explain a little bit more of the technical details if you're interested. So here you can see uh, a fire hazard model, fire risk model, and um, we're in the system at the moment. There's a, there is a model that um, shows the fire risk for the next days to the user, but we're at the moment also researching fire risk for the next years or decades and really to integrate climate risk as well. So we separate between short-term fire risk and fire hazard and long-term fire hazard. And those two um, hazard types have completely different user groups. So the short-term risk is especially important, for example, for firefighters or so that want to deploy resources to areas that are potentially affected. And the long-term fire risk is more interesting to insurers property owners. So this is more the long-term view. So there we're already going in two directions. Then during the fire, you can see snapshots of our system and how it looks like. So we integrate the hotspots and then we cluster them together. And this allows us also to show confidence to the user. And this is also AI assisted at the, um, um, at the moment. So this is, was a really interesting transition phase actually. So we had a, a non-machine learning algorithm before in the system. And now we slowly replace it with a, a machine learning based algorithm. And this is how it works often for us because we're customer facing. So the machine learning algorithms really need to be more robust and better than existing algorithms. And there's a transition phase going on right now. So I also worked in research and this is a little bit different because to have something reliable shown to the user, it needs to be bulletproof. And you can see here also that we can overlay the, the visual layers. And for me as a machine learner, um, this whole creation of a data set that involves so many different data sources is really amazing to work with because throughout this process where, we, where we're building the product, we're also generating a huge training data set of historical data of fire all over the world. And you can see a hotspot again, where we cluster the different hotspots from the satellites. And on the left, I just wanted to show you how many satellites we're integrating. And um, so this is really versatile, or how to say, uh, it's just, um, so it's a very holistic picture 
of one hotspot um, or one fire. And we can use all those satellite sources also to calculate the confidence. How confident are we that there is actually a fire? Because false positives are a problem. If you think of uh, industrial sites, for example, or reflectance errors, because what we are seeing there are thermal anomalies. And to filter out the false positives is also a problem we're working on right now. Then another machine learning problem during the fire is to model the spread. So this is a very, very short-term problem where we basically build a, a, a hyperlocal weather forecasting model um, to see or to forecast how the fire will spread uh, over the next couple of hours. And for this, we use weather data and also the uh, digital elevation model. And then we use the hotspots from our system to see where the, uh, um, uh, where the fire front is evolving to. And this can be learned or this can be trained on our past data sets where we, where we saw or where we have a good database on how hotspots evolved over time. And we have a couple of major fires that we're now training the algorithm on. Another um, product that's in, in place after a fire burn is the um, burned area estimation. And there are a couple of ways to do it. So there is a burned area product out there, but we can also calculate it on our own based on Sentinel-2 imagery, for example, or our own uh, RGB imagery. And this allows us to have a more accurate map of the CO2 or um, not the CO2, biomass that has been burned um, in that area. And to sum it up, so we have this geospatial intelligence platform where we ingest lots of external data sources, which was really tricky. I can, so this is where a lot of thought went into and also a lot of resources to have the data ready. And then we can also add customer data. And um, now we're at slowly adding our own CubeSat data. And this results in a lot of different products as you saw. So mainly around fire, fire risk modeling, fire detection, fire propagation modeling which will then be shown to the end user in the system. And last but not least, I want to mention our CubeSats as well, because there's also potential for machine learning. For example, we are currently working on developing a framework that allows us to deploy machine learning algorithms in orbit. So the, um, the models need to be very small for that. And this, <laughs> this is a very different um, um, technology area. But this would enable us to reduce the downlink. So when we measure or when we um, um, receive the satellite data from the sensor, uh, sensor data, we are able to reduce the, the, um, the downlink to Earth, Earth. And this allows us to be much faster and almost generate a real-time fire detection um, system. And when we receive the data, we are able to change the resolution with super resolution techniques. So right now our pixel size is 200 meters and with super resolution, which is also machine learning, deep learning approaches, um, we're currently trying out a few. There's a lot of existing research already, uh, which, we, which we applied and we're able to get down the pixel size to 100 to 50 meters even. So there's also a lot going on in that space. And we're also investigating different fields. For example, emission estimation can also be done with thermal infrared data, then inferring soil properties. I've heard soil moisture before, there's not a lot of, lot of data on soil moisture. So we're also looking into that and then urban heat monitoring. So there are also other use cases apart from wildfire we're investigating. And yeah, let's see what the future brings. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be looking in the chat uh, shortly after this talk. And yeah, really curious to see and listen to the other talks. And thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here. Thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentation on, uh, on uh, your work and the system you have uh, set up. Uh, unfortunately, our uh, third speaker had uh, to step down at the last minute uh, due to personal uh, uh, situation, so we can uh, move directly into the discussion. And I would like uh, to start uh, 
um, by asking uh, uh, a few questions uh, uh, to our first speakers, uh, speaker and I. Um, so the first question is about uh, the uh, limitations due to the data availability and how can you, for instance, uh, uh, make sure that your uh, approach is going to work also at uh, unsampled uh, locations or uh, how does it work when you would like to try your approach to locations where there are no uh, data available? Yeah, that's thank you, Andrea, for your question. Very interesting. Um, it also, I was actually thinking about that listening to this uh, morning speakers. Uh, of course, um, you know, we're doing uh, deep learning, so using um, those models to be able to predict everywhere. But still, one of the main challenges is uh, to, to see how well our model is performing. And to do that, we often still rely on uh, observations. Um, so that's definitely still a challenge. In this, in our study, we looked at um, the observations we had. So we really tried to use, um, you know, if there were at least six series of data, we were using it. So that allowed us to use more location. But clearly, you could still see big gaps uh, along the coast. I think this is where a physically based model can also help us in some of this validation. Um, in, in a way, it is um, physically based models or yeah, hydrodynamic models in this case will still uh, respect some of the um, properties of the system. Uh, so in that sense, you, you know that uh, it helps you uh, create the best reality to um, what's close to this. Of course, like I said during the presentation, those models uh, need some data that may not be available everywhere. So that's also another challenge. But I think we have to think uh, a bit more um, open into yeah, how we can best uh, validate our models. Um, Thanks. So do you think uh, then uh, combining a physics-based model and uh, machine learning approaches such as the ones you have developed might also bring, uh, let's say, optimal solutions and solve yeah. some, some of these issues? Yeah, I, I really think so. I really think this is the, the way forward. Um, one of the big problems, especially in coastal sciences, is that uh, the models can be very computationally intensive to run, and this is uh, really um, what, what we can gain with uh, deep learning models. Uh, but one of the, you know, one of the big problems is that we have to make sure that the output of those deep learning models are still physically uh, constrained, that it still makes sense. And, and I really think uh, building some sort of joint constraints uh, to make sure that this is respected would be the best uh, combination of both. Thank you. Another question is on uh, the uh, applicability of these uh, models, especially under, uh, let's say, uh, unforeseen conditions. And when we think at climate projections, we know that uh, our model uh, have actually been trained under current, let's say, for instance, climate conditions. How does it work? Do you think that uh, your model would be still reliable? What are the challenges uh, connected uh, with uh, uh, trying to use the model, uh, these approaches in kind of projections mode. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for your question. I think uh, without talking about the future, even unforeseen condition of the present, so thinking about extremes uh, would already be such, um, yeah, we would already see such a dilemma because the, the model, um, that's why in the conclusion that I was mentioning about the performance metrics, I think this is also very important. Uh, seeing how well or how we train our model is also uh, how we're gonna optimize those parameters. I mean, if our performance metrics do not specifically uh, account for extremes, it means we might uh, underestimate extremes. So I think already for the present, this, this may be a challenge. Um, so really trying to understand why are we building this model and which gap is it filling? Uh, and for the future, even more so because some of those processes and some of, of those dynamics may, may change. Um, also because of non-stationary trends. So right now in our models, we were correcting for this, but if we wanna look in the future, we should actually explicitly include those uh, in our model. Uh, here again, I think um, reducing this uncertainty by using uh, hydrodynamic models can, uh, can help. It's of course not uh, an answer to everything and it will have its own challenges, but I think it can at least help uh, steer or understand um, yeah, understand what's happening within the within the system. 
Thank you. And uh, I mean, it was quite interesting that uh, during your presentation, you mentioned also uh, the issue with the reduced vari variability. And uh, is this an intrinsic limitation uh, of, uh, of these approaches, meaning that uh, so there are not able uh, when the variability is so much reduced to basically uh, distinguish from noise? And what are the challenges in those areas uh, when it comes to extremes? Because we know that uh, you might have reduced variability, but still yeah. a very long tail. Uh, meaning that the risk of extremes is uh, still high. Yeah, no, exactly. So clearly uh, I, I, I showed this weak point because I would love that in the future research, this is being solved. I think the tropics is a very interesting uh, place to, to look at and to improve our models because extremes are uh, first very rare by definition, but also very different than most of the data we're training our model. Um, so I think in that sense, uh, making use also of synthetic modelings. Uh, so for this study, we were using um, reanalysis uh, climate, which had little extremes. Um, so clearly this small variability. If we can steer the model to better understand how to capture extremes by synthetic modelling of, for example, tropical cyclone tracks, um, that could be one way to better for the model to better understand which climatic conditions uh, create uh, those extremes. So again, I think you know to 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 join into other uh, initiatives, um, yeah, to to help the model understand when are those um, extreme conditions happening. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I mean, my last question is on the wind waves. You mentioned that uh, you you haven't taken into account the wind waves. Uh, do you so? Do you think that uh, um, this uh, integration of wind waves might bring also additional challenges? Might be too complex? Or... Yeah, definitely. Uh, first of all, the, the reason why we did not integrate it is that uh, often those stations needs to measure um, sea level at a, a much higher temporal frequency. And that was not the case uh, here. So we looked at uh, hourly. So most of the time you need much, much uh, higher frequency. Uh, but I, I see here a huge, uh, and second of, second of all, some of those stations are often in locations that are protected for waves. So then there would be a, a miss of where do we consider waves and where not. That being said, uh, we know that uh, the wave contribution uh, along the coast uh, is very important. Um, so in the future, it's, it's really important to include this. And it is often a very computationally intensive um, processes, even more so than, than storm surge. So clearly here, AI uh, can help. Um, but I think, uh, I think this is even more in its uh, infancy. I mean, I say that I'm not clearly not an expert on, on waves. Um, but I, I see a huge uh, potential um, in this, um, yeah, to try to include it. Um, but but I, I don't think it will be, a, yeah, to my knowledge, it's, it's not there yet. So it still needs quite some work. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now I have uh, some questions for uh, Julia. So I would like to ask you, uh, based on your presentations, what are, uh, let's say, the challenging to address user uh, users' needs and actually who are the users of uh, such a uh, uh, complex system you offer? Okay, so the users we're tackling right now, um, or we're working with are, for example, national parks or large forestry owners. So people who own and want to protect forests but right now I'm also in uh, London um, at an insurance conference and also reinsurance is very interested in this topic. What I want to add is that in our investment contract right now, it's stated that we are not working together with the military um, because wildfire or hotspot detection is obviously also a military use case and uh, we're, we're not doing that at the moment. Um, so the challenges we have with our users are that they need the system to be really accurate. And if we display um, um, a risk based on a fire, machine learning fire risk model to them, um, they also want to understand where it comes from and it definitely needs to be reliable. So it's, it's a challenge, first of all, setting up the model as robust as it, it, this sort of adds on what you asked before. So it has to work globally. And um, so we need a really robust model and also then the output has to be communicated in such a way that the user understands the probability. And this is limiting in the, in the system design. So there are 
challenges. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, you mentioned a key point, uh, how to communicate effectively the uncertainties. And this one, uh, this is one of also the main issues when it comes uh, to other, uh, um, for instance, climate services, uh, because users indeed often uh, do not understand that uh, there is a probability behind and uh, approaches are not, of course, uh, perfect. Yeah, and for us, it has real world consequences. So when we say there's 100% of a fire, for example, someone will deploy resources there or someone will not go to another region. So we can have that wrong many times. Otherwise, they will lose trust in our system. So, yeah. Uh, well, that's something uh, extremely interesting. And uh, besides the wildfire, do you have, or uh, you, you mentioned a few, and that was uh, very interesting, the urban island as well, but uh, also from the chat, uh, they are asking if you have uh, other use cases, for instance, in terms of wall, uh, water quality degradations and so on. So what is, uh, let's say, uh, the use cases or the applications you offer? Yeah, okay, I can't, <laughs> so, um... Other use cases we're looking in, for me, most interesting is soil <laughs> as a geoscientist. So I would love to have better soil moisture data. So we're really working on that, but that's, that's also involving um, changing the instrument that we're sending to space probably. So there's a lot, pros, uh, lots, lots of processes behind that. And another use case we're currently looking into is emission estimation, which I find really interesting. So how much, um, CO2 is stored in forests at the moment and how much is lost when the forest is destroyed. And that could be combined with the drought, with the drought model and the fire model so that we know when, when the um, um, forest is not in a healthy um, situation um, so that we can estimate how much CO2 is, is being lost. And also with reforestation, how much CO2 is, is stored. So I find that use case really interesting, but very, very early stages here. Thanks. Another uh, question uh, from the chat is also that I find quite interesting. Uh, do you use uh, the same approaches uh, for different time scales, for instance, uh, the short term and the long term uh, predictions? So, how, the, how does it work? Okay, yeah. So, we compared for the fire risk prediction, we compared pixel wise classification approaches where we use an onset, so a um, time sequence as input, and we experimented with days to weeks or so, and we arrived at a certain sequence that's best for the model. So, the, the um, method, methods are different for the short term forecasting and the long term forecasting. For the short term forecasting, um, we also, so the best result we have right now is with image with an image based method that uses 3D uh, convolutional nets and it takes in the the spatial um, surrounding of the of the pixel but also takes in the time sequence and we get really good with us with that with the long term risk model it's a little bit different because we take climate data as an input and um, there the pixel wise approach seems to be better at the moment but how we usually do is, is we compare a multitude of different machine learning approaches and then really see which one performs best on the metrics um, we measure it on. And uh, we also created our own metrics for that. Okay, and connected to this question, I wonder, will uh, this bring a challenge, challenges when you think of, uh, let's say, uh, bringing uh, ML or integrating ML directly into the satellite, because you mentioned as, uh, you know, future plans, uh, this possibility. Yeah, so the idea would be is that the um, machine learning algorithm on the satellite can be updated anytime. So if we if we want to change something with the algorithm um, that we can contact the satellite anytime and uh, update it. So I think we're on a good way for that. And the challenges we will have to see because the system is not yet in operation. So I can probably tell you more in the next year's iteration of AI for good on how this is going. Yeah. Uh, there is another, I mean, uh, interesting aspect that you mentioned about the super resolution. Um, maybe can you say a bit more, because this is uh, very, I think, interesting that you uh, basically can bring the resolution from uh, 200 meters to really two meters. Yeah, so uh, this was a very active research, it is a very active research topic. And um, we were looking mostly into single channel super resolution so that we're using the same channel 
and not combine it with different channels because we only have one sensor or our main sensor is the thermal infrared. And they were also, also using a time-based approach so that we use uh, different time steps of the single of one single pixel and then um, um, yeah, derive the super resolution from there. So we're working a lot with sequence input <laughs> in machine learning and not too much with spatial input. And we see that, yeah, this is the most beneficial for us at the moment. Thanks. And um, my last uh, question is on the actually, when you detect uh, the different, uh, let's say, events, uh, do you also have an approach to basically cluster the events and say, well, this is a unique one? Uh, um... Yeah, that was one of the main challenges when the system uh, was created, because the hotspots are very different in size. So the geostationary hotspots, for example, they have uh, they create two kilometer wide hotspots, and then from other systems we get hotspots within this large hotspot. Um, so we created a clustering algorithms algorithm um, that gives out a probability or confidence on yeah how how confident we are that this is an actual wildfire that the hotspots be, belong together and that it's not something else. And what I want to mention is that we also integrate customer data now. So the, the customer can label if it's probably a solar uh, plant or something else. Um, that's definitely not a wildfire. So we also integrate this in our data set right now. And yeah. Well, that's uh, very, very interesting. So it means that in the long term, you could also have, uh, let's say, for instance, a database uh, uh, with uh, this local information that can be used to increase the robustness of uh, your approach. Absolutely. Um, we're using that right now already. And this is a really nice situation to be in as a machine learner. <laughs> Great. So I would like uh, to thank uh, again uh, our uh, two speakers of uh, this session and uh, thank you very much all for attending uh, this uh, second session of, uh, of the event. Uh, we can now have uh, an earlier uh, uh, than uh, planned lunch break and uh, we are going to reconvene at uh, 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hello everyone, welcome back from the break. Uh, we were hoping that you had the opportunity to, um, to have coffee or have lunch. We're now going to restart um, the webinar with session two on AI for communications, for which I would like to pass the floor to our moderator for the day, David Oman, who's the Associate Program Officer of Digital Strategies and Innovation at UNFCCC. Over to you, David. Thank you, Maitri, and welcome back, everybody, uh, from the break. I hope you had some refreshments and you had like, a very good morning. Um, this is a really fascinating work that I've been involved in for quite a while now. Um, and I'm happy to be a moderator today for the session on AI for Communications. Um, a brief overview of what the AI for Communications Working Group is doing. So um, basically the, the, the gist of the work of the, of the, of the working group is that they, um, that they consider systems that are used uh, before, during, or immediately after a natural disaster um, happens and, and how basically AI-based communication system can contribute to, uh, to providing some relief in that, in that regard. So their, their work here aims to produce a report at the end that, um, that goes from a liter literature review to like really specific use cases. And it has been fascinating to watch this, the work unfolding um, over the past uh, a year or so that it has been, um, since it has been established. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our speakers today. 
who will give you some kind of insight into our three use cases into what is uh, what what can what AI for communications can contribute or what what um, systems can contribute um, to uh, natural disaster risk management um, and how how AI systems communication system can help here. We have three speakers today: um, Daniel Kuzin, um, Anon Uriafin, and Maria Michalopoulou. Uh, will be joining me in that order. So first of all, um, I hope that Daniel is with us. And if you're with us, please show your face. Hi, Daniel. Glad to have you here. So Daniel, Daniel is a um, senior research associate at uh, Lancaster University, and he has his PhD degree from Sheffield University and a specialist degree from Lomonosov Moscow State University. Um, and his research interests now include crowdsourcing, object detention, detection, sparse modeling, non-parametric bias. I don't even know what that is. And applications of machine learning medicine. Um, Daniel, over to you and your presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really ple pleased to be there, at least virtually. So. I hope you can see my slides. So I'm going to talk today about our approach for rapid labeling of the data during the disasters so that it can be used for training the computer vision models during the disaster in a short period of time so that it can actually be used to help the disaster responders on the site while they're working on the disaster. So this is a joint work with my colleagues, uh, Brooke Simmons from Lancaster, Steve Rees from Oxford, and Olga Supov from Bath. So uh, this work was focused on the hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017. So our partner, Rescue Global, was deployed on the ground. So they were actually handling the disaster on the Caribbean. And the, we asked the, the volunteers to mark the damage to assist uh, the Rescue Global organization. So we used the digital globe data from the open data program. And uh, we asked the volunteers on the Zooniverse crowdsourcing platform to mark the damage. So they, this is example on the left. They have marked one of the four types of damages, for example, road blockage, flooded areas, temporary settlements, or structural damage for the buildings. And then we used those marks to aggregate them and to provide the density maps of damage to Rescue Global so that they know where to focus their efforts. So that's the example of the data that we had. This is the example for structural damage of the buildings. And we have three different severities, minor, significant, and catastrophic. Also, on the image, there are IDs of volunteers that have provided those marks. And uh, on the top left of the image, uh, there is a, a digit two make, marking that two of the volunteers marked this uh, image as undamaged. And uh, so we have two problems here. First is how to aggregate the marks. And uh, the second one is how to use those aggregated marks for training the computer vision algorithm for further areas of this damage, of this disaster. So for the first problem, we found out that there are existing a data set such as XVU2 or SpaceNet, which can provide a good, large and good data set for detecting the, damage, the buildings. And so we have also used the computer vision architecture with the, which was the ensemble of the ResNet architectures for detecting the building footprints based on this data set. And we have obtained the good performance on our data. The problem came at the second 
point when we try to use the same data set for detecting the damage, the severity of damage. And it turns out that our images were probably of a different quality because we, they were obtained during the disaster and the, the quality could be degraded or they could be bad atmospheric conditions and uh, the neural networks trained on those existing data sets were not suitable and they need to be fine-tuned to detect the severity of damage. And so we uh, think that our approach of point labeling is a good approach for this problem because it allows to rapidly obtain the required labels for fine-tuning the data. The problem is how to aggregate those labels inside the buildings. So we have detected the footprints using the existing neural networks, but how to aggregate a lot of different marks from uh, different volunteers. We have uh, considered three algorithms here. First is the majority voting, which uh, uh, ju just uh, finds the most probable label for those uh, buildings. And we can also train the weights to, to for different types of damage. And we also considered David skin and the uh, Bayesian classifier combination. So here we have uh, the labels from the classifiers, C, I, K, W1. And uh, we can infer the hidden variables, which are the true classes for that particular data point, the confusion matrices for the classifiers and the prior distributions for the true labels. And alpha and nu here are just hyperparameters. Uh, the inclusion of these confusion matrices allows to train us the, uh, for the systematic errors of each particular volunteer. And therefore we can use them in our estimations during the aggregation and improve the quality of the predictions. And uh, we're using variational inference here to obtain the estimates for the distribution of the true labels for each building. So we actually obtain not the point marks, but the distribution of all potential with uh, values for all potential classes. And here are the examples where we compare the majority voting and by using classifier combination. Here I have excluded the read skin because it provides the similar results to by using classifier combination, but without the distributions. And we found out that the simplest majority voting can, uh, contains a lot of errors mm -hmm. because usually some people have marked almost any of the buildings. It could be sun reflections, or it could be birds or some rubbish. And therefore, if we use the majority voting, usually we obtain a lot of minor damage labels for the undamaged buildings. And we, it turns out that the David skin and Bayesian classifier combination perform much better for this problem. Now we have the individual labels for all the buildings. We have the footprints, and we can use them to train the object detection neural network. So here we used the simple architecture from the existing libraries and we obtain the good predictions for the uh, test areas of our Caribbean islands. So here we use the metrics from the COCO data set, which is the average precision, but it doesn't account that we have very small buildings with probably uh, uh, some errors in defining their shapes. And therefore the average precision seems to be low, but when you look from the uh, disaster response <coughs> point of view, it is enough for the whole, uh, for our problem. And uh, here are some more examples. So it turns out that we detect most of the images, most of the damaged buildings with the correct labels. So to sum it all, we have uh, provided the approach for the uh, quick labeling during the disaster. So in our case, it can take just one day from deploying the problem on the crowdsourcing uh, platform, then getting the results and uh, aggregating them and using them for training the new role network, we can get the uh, updated neural network in just one or two days. 
and uh, it should be enough for most of the disasters. And uh, so that's the example of the performing of the performance on the Dominica when we have marked the areas where the potential damage is. And so in the future, we're going to consider other types of damage, such as flooded areas or road blockage. We are also going to implement the active learning scenario. So in the to show the volunteers only the most confusing examples for the neural network. So in order to do it, we're going to have the ensemble of the neural networks to estimate the uncertainties. And given the uncertainty that we have from our aggregation algorithm, it should be enough to estimate the confusions of the neural networks. And then we're going to integrate it in the Zooniverse platform to handle the future disasters. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel, and also thank you for sticking to the time box. Um, this was a very short, very rich um, presentation. Um, please hold your questions until the end. We'll have, a, we'll have time to discuss and ask questions after the third presentation. Um, but now I would like to invite uh, Arnon Huyafin. Um, so if you could please switch on your camera. Hi, Arnon. Um, Hi. So Arnon uh, holds, uh, is the founder and CEO of Z Malaria. He holds a BA in philosophy, politics, and economics from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and also worked there as a lecturer in statistics. Um, and before founding ZEP, um, he worked at the Israeli Security Authority in regulating the stock market and uh, later led the RMT team at Site Diagnostic, which is focusing on malaria di diagnostics. And I assume that's also where you got your idea to found your, your business. Um, apart from that, Anna has co-authored several papers and patents and has won academic excellence prizes. So we are really excited, Arnon, to hear more about your, um, your about that malaria. Um, and yeah, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you uh, for uh, introducing me and thank you for having me here. Um, <clears throat> so malaria is one of the most uh, deadly disease. Um, it, uh, in the last year, it killed uh, uh, more than 600,000 people uh, in Africa. Uh, which is much more than a COVID killed in Africa, for example. And um, the interesting thing about malaria that, uh, is that malaria could be eliminated. So uh, take, for example, uh, um, COVID. COVID is disease that transmitted um, by people meeting each other. And people will all, always meet each other, so it's very uh, difficult to control on the infection me mechanism. And also, if you manage to eliminate COVID, it can, uh, um, because this uh, disease could be transmitted from animals back to human, so it, it, it can be back. But malaria uh, is different because malaria is, is transmitted only human to human, no animals. Um, and also, it transmitted through the uh, uh, mosquito, the, the Anopheles mosquito. And it is more, inter uh, uh, more easy to control mosquito than uh, controlling a uh, uh, contact be between people. Uh, so this is the, why the malaria theoretically could be uh, eliminated. But it's, it, it is not only theory. Uh, many countries already eliminated malaria, including many countries in the uh, uh, US, uh, South Europe, like Italy, uh, here in Israel, uh, Egypt, uh, Paraguay recently, China. A, 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 and malaria could be eliminated, and the uh, standard way to do so is by treat, treating standing water bodies. So if you treat all the standing water bodies, mosquito will not breed, and if they will not breed, eventually they will disappear. Actually, quite fastly disappear because mosquito live, you know, only two, three, four weeks. Um, and this is the idea. This is how it has been done. But nowadays in Africa, those kind of efforts are just fail again and again. And the reason they fail is uh, operational. It is actually very difficult to reach all of the water bodies. And the a mosquito species in Africa is very uh, opportunistic. It can breed even in a, a 
more or less small water body like a, a temporal, a, a temporal a, a swamp of two meters or something like that. Um, and, um, and it's very difficult to find all of them. If you have this street with 300 villages, in each village 200 uh, uh, standing water bodies, how, how, how can you manage that? And we basically develop mobile app uh, aiming to do so. Uh, so this is not uh, artificial intelligence yet, but basically uh, um, we send the, the employees, the workers. So the, 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 this is the island of Sao Tome. I will zoom out so that you have a, a context. Yes, the, 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 this is Africa, and this is a very small island of Sao Tome. Um, well, we, we are trying to eliminate the malaria from Sao Tome by treatment of water bodies. And the thing is, let's, if we look a, a, a closer, there are many water bodies on the ground. Yes, so a, a, you spoke about a, a, a crowdsourcing. This is a bit similar, but by people that actually go around and when they look at water bodies, they just report those water bodies. So for example, here, this one, look at this water body, you see because of the leak, and we can see when the water body is sprayed, we can see when workers uh, uh, did not find the water body, etc. Maybe let's pick another one. Uh, uh, this one difficult to see. Uh, maybe choose this one. So this is another water body from agriculture area. And again, we can see when people sprayed the water body and also we can see when people sampled the water body. Sample meaning they, they looked if the water body contained mosquito larva. And we can make sure that the people actually, that the worker actually uh, completely scanned the, the village. And the way we do so is because the app showed them where they visited and where not. Yes, I'm showing you the dashboard, but you see that for this specific village, the workers did not scan properly this area. So that we can send them again, because the challenge is to locate every single water body. So this is the mobile app. This is our management system, uh, uh, but we have, also another layer of uh, 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 artificial intelligence. And this is, you see the uh, transparent and white uh, uh, squares. The transparent squares is where the uh, uh, algorithm expected to see uh, uh, no water bodies, while the white is where the algorithm expected to see water bodies based on analysis of satellite imagery. How can satellite imagery tell you where water bodies, bodies will occur? So it's very easy with the big water bodies. You can, and we, we detect uh, by machine vision from satellite imagery, big water bodies like, you know, a 15 meter swamp. But mo uh, as I said before, most of the water bodies are smaller, like a 10 meter square water body. And then we cannot detect them directly from the satellite imagery, especially because we use a, a satellite imagery for free, like the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Um, but, for example, by using a, a topography, we know that water bodies tend to be on the valley, for example, or we know that water bodies tend to be more on a, a, like, so for example, it's very easy to understand that this area is, is jungle, yes, and we know that in the jungle we have less standing water bodies than in areas like this one, which is more, you know, like a, a, a agriculture, yes. So this is how the uh, algorithm can predict in, in uh, accuracy of around 70% uh, uh, the location of water bodies. And this is how he can also uh, um, direct the workers to focus on those areas. Uh, we used to detect also houses because if you detect, because mosquito breed around the houses, if you have area with the water bodies, but no people there, there will be no anopheles in this area because mosquitoes are like the combination of water bodies and people. Uh, 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 but recently uh, 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 we got from Google, Google issued a new uh, 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 huge data set of location of houses in Africa and their uh, algorithm are better than ours. And now we are using uh, 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 Google data on, on houses. Um, yeah. Now we have two additional sources of data. We, we have RAINS, which I, I, I also, it's not only where to scan, but also when to scan. So we analyze a, a, 
uh, wet, weather data, rain, uh, humidity, because the humidity and temperature impact the uh, evaporation of standing water bodies, which is also important. And lastly, uh, we have data from the workers because the worker go around and look for water bodies. But for example, if we send someone to area and then we send someone else and we see that one of them did find water bodies and the another one did not find. So we ask ourselves why. So we have, this is one more additional source of data which we can analyze. Uh, uh, we are only now starting to do so. And the last source of uh, uh, data is by a, a drone imagery, which has higher a resolution than satellite imagery. And this, again, something that we are only starting to do now. Uh, um, our aim is to be accurate enough to locate all of the water bodies. And this is how we can, if, if you do so, the way to malaria elimination is actually quite short. Uh, uh, this is what we uh, uh, learned from the history. As I said, for example, from countries like here, Israel and Egypt, uh, Cyprus uh, that eliminated malaria exactly by doing so. Um, and uh, yes, I, th I think this is the uh, important part. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Arnaud. Um, this has been really fascinating. And thanks also for the live demo. I've noted down a lot of questions, um, but I will also invite everybody in the audience to uh, type your questions in the, um, the Q&A A box. We'll have time after the next presentation um, to, to ask our speakers, and I would encourage you to make use of that opportunity. Um, we will now switch over to Maria. Maria Michalopoulou, and um, she works in informatics. She has a BSc in informatics and an MSc in communication engineering from RWTH Aachen, which is actually uh, 100 kilometers away from where I sit in Bonn. Um, she also received her doctoral degree in engineering on wireless net networks. Um, so since then, uh, she has worked six years uh, as a full time research and teaching assistant at the Institute for Network Systems of the RIT. Uh, at the TH Aachen University. And since 2016, she started collaborating with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Cyprus. And since September 2017, she joined KIOS Research and Innovation Center of Excellence as a research scientist. So Maria's research interests include topics in the areas of wireless networks, transportation, and emergency response. And now, um, Maria, I would like, without further ado, hand over to you for your uh, presentation on uh, for your presentation on uh, AI for communication systems. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just give me one second to share my screen. Okay. So, um, hi, thank you for, for the introduction. Um, it's been a very interesting uh, workshop so far. All the talks were very interesting and thank you for having me too. So my name is Maria Mihalopoulou. I'm currently working at the KIOS Research and Innovation Center. So we are a fairly large research center uh, with currently more than 150 researchers. Um, the gross majority of them, uh, of us, have an engineering back background, um, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, um, software, uh, and, and we also have many physicists. So um, as a research center, we are part of the University of Cyprus in Cyprus. And uh, <laughs> let me mention also about the name of the institution. So the KIOS, it sounds like an acronym, but it's, it's not an acronym. It's from the Greek mythology. So Kios was the Titan that was uh, asking all the intelligent questions in Greek mythology. So that's where the name comes from. Um, okay, so as a research, the, the focus of the research center is mainly 
uh, in the intelligent uh, monitoring, control, management, and security of complex, complex large-scale systems uh, with a special focus on all critical infrastructure systems, namely uh, power, water, in transportation, and healthcare systems. So uh, critical infrastructure systems are of utmost, utmost importance in the context of disaster management. Therefore, we do have a, a, a large group that they are uh, uh, constantly basically working in the field of emergency response. Uh, so my presentation today, oops, sorry. So my presentation today will not be um, very technical. We just decided to present you a, a couple of use cases uh, that the group was uh, working during the last uh, couple, uh, uh, last two, three years. So I will present three, three applications. So the first application um, we, we, are, we, are based, we are currently working on uh, is developing detection and tracking algorithms using UAVs. So we basically employ computer vision AI techniques uh, first to detect and subsequently to track objects on a video that is captured by a UAV. So the algorithm, uh, the trick is that they are, all the algorithms need to be fast and lightweight uh, in order to be able to operate uh, on real time on a normal and not especially powerful computer uh, in order to be able to use during emergency response operations and have the and be processed uh, in the field and uh, have the the outcomes in the uh, emergency operation center that is usually set up uh, there uh, during the emergency response operations. So uh, we we so we are having the the detected objects visually so shown on the screen as uh, it's shown is shown here on the on the on the figures. And at the same time, so we, all, we have all the information saved in CSV files, all the details uh, that are um, I then track. So, um, the, so basically, uh, we have so it's it's a two-part problem. So detection is the first problem that we need to solve, and for this we use a convolutional neural network. And the tracking after detecting an object. Uh, then we are interested in tracking the object, uh, identify the direction, the speed, and this kind of information about it. So uh, for this, we are using several, we are combining actually several algorithms, and it depends also about what we are detecting. So if we are detecting vehicles, the speeds are, uh, we, we are interested in detecting the speed. If they are persons, we are, but we are not especially interested in the speed. We might be interested in other things, like if the person is moving, the direction of the person, if it's standing, and this kind of stuff. If it's still and it's not moving, which might mean in an emergency situation that it might be injured, and this kind of stuff. So uh, this is an example of uh, one of our field exercises that we conduct. So you see, so this is, oops, this is the next week. So I'm sorry, I don't know. Today we're not doing very well with the slides. So uh, as you see, uh, we have people moving here. What I wanted to show you here is that this is the this is the display that uh, the first responders see in the emergency operation center. This is from a search and rescue exercise, and as you see, uh, the the drone is flying at a quite high altitude. So uh, if it if it was not for the algorithm, uh, you couldn't be sure if there are persons there, you see that people are very, very, very small, but the, with, by means of the algorithm, we are able to detect all the persons uh, that are in the, in, the, in the picture. And this is another example. This is uh, detecting the vehicles on the street. Uh, it's very small, but if, we, if you displayed it in a very large screen display um, that we sometimes have in the, in the labs, so uh, these green tags here show the instantaneous speed of each vehicle. So we are detecting the speed of the vehicle. And we also, as you see here, uh, that, that basically the directions of the vehicles and if they are turning and these kind of things. OK. OK, so um, this, 
the, the person detector, uh, detector actually that I showed you first and the first video uh, is part of uh, one project that we are currently running, the Artion that is funded by the European Union civil protection uh, proposals. So uh, we have the, the code is available, it's a Python code. And actually if you, if the code is available through the website of the project. So uh, through the through a portal that we have set up uh, through this through the Artion web page, and there we will actually uh, plan to uh, release all the algorithms, data sets, and manuals that we will be creating uh, throughout the project, and we hopefully be be conti continue to uh, populate this portal with uh, with other algorithms algorithms as well. Uh, after the ending of the project, that's why we gave a generic name, Disaster Management AI Portal. Okay, so, um, so following, I would like to talk a bit about uh, our work in the AIDES project. So the AIDES project is again funded by the European Union Civil Protection. Okay, so nowadays during emergency response operations, we are able to deploy multiple sources that collect data. Uh, like several drones with a variety of cameras and sensors uh, as conventional cameras, thermal multispectral cameras, LIDAR sensors, um, radiometric sensors, and so forth. The problem is that we have a large volume of, of heterogeneous data from which is difficult for first responders to manually extract information in real time in the field. Uh, so we have the information, but the problem is how to, uh, we have the data, I'm sorry, but the, the problem is how to get the information from those data uh, in, in real time. So in the best case, we will be needing several first responders that are dedicated to this task during the operation. So to solve this issue, we developed the AIDERS platform. Uh, the platform aims to merge and analyze all, all this data. So it maps and visualizes all the data on a single platform and makes information directly accessible for a human being to understand. So subsequently, analysis of this data aims to, enhance, to help with the decision-making. Uh, for example, the platform will, produce, will provide tools um, for forecasting analysis, predict disaster evolution, uh, predict uh, cascading effects and these sort of functions. So from a technical point of view, the ADES platform is quite uh, demanding. So it, it, it will integrate a variety of intelligent techniques, intelligent UAV path planning, multi-source sensory data fusion, uh, real-time algorithms, um, computer vision algorithms basically uh, to uh, analyze the, the scene and then to, uh, um, to do uh, detection and prediction of uh, several phenomena. And uh, of course, reliable and secure communication uh, and data transmission protocols in order to uh, exchange all this data between the data sources to the uh, platform and so forth. Okay, so this is just as, as a video showing the the, I, I'm not going to play it all. So you see that in this demo we have, so this is not the final version of the platform. It's, it's, uh, no, it's still an ongoing project. So we have two, drone, two drones here. We draw the path of each, we set up the path for each drone manually here. And as you see, oops, I cannot. Mm -hmm. And as you see, basically as the drone continues to, as the drones are traveling through at, at this path, uh, we start, so this, these are the images that are captured by each of the drones. And as the time um, progresses, you see that we, are sta we start uh, constructing the, um, the picture, so to say, of the whole area. Um, yeah, something like that. Um, so it's pretty useful because when you have a drone flying and then you're just uh, sitting in the emergency operation center and you see what the drone is showing, first of all, you don't know exactly where in the map this picture corresponds to. So the platform, the first things to do is that it puts the pictures on the map and then it constructs. So it, it merges all the, all the um, 
photos or videos that are taken and constructs, constructs a picture of the whole area. Uh, and then, as we said, up, um, up, up above this, we, will, we started building uh, detection algorithms and uh, algorithms for uh, prediction, detection, and this kind of stuff. Okay, so um, let's move to the final uh, application that I would like to show you today. So this is the Icarus platform. Uh, it's an automatic autonomous power infrastructure inspection toolkit. So the electricity, the, 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 the backstory is the following. So the electricity authorities must perform an inspection of the whole power infrastructure once a year. I don't know in other, what's the situation in other countries, but in Cyprus, summers are very hot and the danger for fires is extremely high during the uh, summer. So uh, we, the electricity authorities has to do this every winter, the inspection of the power lines as a prevention to the summer fires. So you can imagine that is not an easy task to send every year skilled personnel throughout the country to locate every power line and every pole and detect whether there are problems or not. And there are also locations and areas that are not easily accessible for um, not easily accessible. So this is also a very big problem. So in collaboration with the electrical authority in Cyprus, we developed Icarus. Um, I will show in the video at the same time. So what is Icarus? Icarus is um, an embedded platform for UAVs that autonomously acquires data for mapping and identifies the gradation conditions in the power network. So uh, we do real-time processing in order to, um, to detect the poles and uh, to record their accurate positions. And this is also necessary because the drone is, is, autonomous, uh, is autonomously um, uh, de defining its path. So it has to detect some objects in order and the lines also in order to decide uh, where to do. So we are not controlling it from the ground. It starts from, from some point and it finds the network on its own and it scans the whole network. So during inspection, the drone gathers data. Uh, so this is done, the, the, the thing that I described so far is done online. Uh, during the flying, the, the drone uh, gathers also data that are not processed. Uh, it's very difficult to process uh, online and it's, not, it's also not necessary. Uh, but they are sub subsequently processed with the uh, machine learning algorithms to identify the um, insulators and their conditions, to identify obstacles, um, to detect power, um, power lines, and to generate digital surface models. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to know that, note that uh, by deploying Icarus, it will also allow us to uh, map the whole power infrastructure network. And then this information and this uh, toolkit can be subsequently used during disaster recovery. So in the first phase, we are talking about uh, disaster prediction, disaster, um, um, disaster, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing the word. Anyway, before the disaster to pre prevention, to prevent the disaster. But after mapping all the network, we'll, we'll be able to assess damages and this kind of stuff in the recovery phases. Um, okay, so Icarus, uh, it's, it's planned to be used actually first time next winter here in Cyprus for the yearly inspection of the power network. And we are looking forward in uh, doing the, <laughs> The, the real time, the reality check of the toolkit. Okay, so thank you very much for this uh, time. And uh, yeah, that's all from my side. David, I'm sorry, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. I was saying a lot of smart things, so I tried to uh, recover. So um, thanks, Maria, for the uh, 
for, for the great contributions. It's actually three case studies in one, and all seem to be very mature. Um, I would also invite the other speakers, uh, um, Arnon and um, Daniel, to switch on their cameras again, because now we are going to discussion phase. Um, thanks also, Maria, for, for revealing another knowledge gap of mine. It's kiosk today that I didn't know, and non-parametric base. I, need, I, I, I tried to uh, look it up in the meantime, but I think I still haven't understood it. Um, I don't know, Maria, that Icarus is also an acronym, uh, not an acronym, but also from the mythology. And I hope they are not flying too close to the sun. Um, but I think for UIVs, it's pro probably not that possible. Um, let's start probably with one question for, um, for um, Daniel and Arnon, um, because you both have um, like not the same, but similar approaches. Um, so you both use crowdsourced approaches um, for annotation um, and also for confirmation of stagnant water. Um, a, so how do you ensure the quality and reliability of this information? How do you motivate or incentivize the crowd contributions? And is there anything that you can learn from each other's approach? Um, just as a like, very instant reaction. Um, I don't know who wants to go first. Okay, I can go probably. Please, thank you. Okay, so we have a very specific platform, Zoo Universe, and here the people who come there to volunteer, they are motivated to provide some unpaid, unpaid input to improve the science. For example, I think originally it was for astronomy, and uh, now it's also used for disaster response. So they're not motivated to do anything bad and they just want to do some good labels. And on average, their labels are quite good. Also, uh, we're running those estimations of the confusion matrices and uh, potentially we can remove the bad performing uh, examples and uh, just so we automatically choose the good labels let's say like this thank you a, a very interesting uh, approach Daniel uh, our approach is actually quite the opposite so because our thing is obs obsession to look at every single water body uh, uh, we cannot leave anything to uh, um, to subjectivity, etc. So uh, most of our employees are actually, we, we have some volunteers, but actually most of the employees are a, a government employees that are paid to go and scan the area and they are supervised to do so. And we have, a, 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 we use a lot of a, a methods of quality assurance. So for example, every worker that finishes day, a, someone else come and scan the exactly the same area to locate the same water bodies. We also try to use drone to have also a, a, a different a source of a, a, a location of water bodies and then someone manually tag the water bodies in the drone. Um, and all of that, again, to because of our obsession to, to reach to 100%. Uh, we do hope to reach a, a, a more community engagement, more volunteers. Um, and, and the motivation is clear. People don't want malaria in their uh, uh, villages, uh, um, but we feel it will take time. We, we feel we before must have a, a build a, a very strong and and, a, 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 and clear a, a understanding of where the water bodies are, and only then a, a enable people to to participate without strong quality assurance. A last point is that people also uh, help us. I, I mean, just people in the street because our worker go around and look for water bodies and then he just ask people, do you know where I can find standing water bodies here? And they point, oh, just after this uh, uh, hedge, you can find one. So thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, we have more questions lining up in the Q&A that I will come to um, soon. So um, first now a question to Maria. Um, so 
you had you have presented three um, uh, three basically um, uh, solutions. So, is there? Do you also foresee any um, any on the ground verification for those? Because for for me, it looked like that's uh, mainly driven by, like automated and driven by UAVs or three UAV imagery. Is in any of these um, in, in any of these projects also foreseen that there is an underground verification, or is it simply or is it merely the the, the AI um, working behind and trying to identify this? Um, I'm not sure what you mean actually by the question. Um... I, I can elaborate. So, for example, the um, you have the pilot project now for the for the uh, energy networks. Right, so taking place next year. So, will uh, how how is the the test phase going? So, for example, because um, is is it is it going to be merely or only through UAVs, or is there in this test phase also like the traditional method that runs alongside, so that you like the, the the new method basically can be verified through on the ground observation or traditional observations? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I understand. Uh, yes, for the. Okay, to be honest, as I mentioned, this, for example, for this project with the uh, electricity inspection, next winter is the first uh, time that we are going to use it. Uh, we don't have, so this is in collaboration with the authorities in Cyprus, the electrical authorities. Typically what we do is yes, in the, so we don't have a plan yet for this specific thing, but my guessing is that yes, we will have, the, the, I mean the first, one, two times it will be, I mean, they will not, will not, they cannot switch directly from their manual way to the automatic way. It, it will probably be done two ways as they do it as in uh, traditionally as they, and, and we will also do it in parallel with the, uh, with the new way. And then we, we will uh, verify the, the results. I mean, we cannot. Yes, it's it's a real it's a real uh, it's a real uh, word case uh, application. It cannot just switch automatically. Thanks, uh, and, and, and it will be fascinating then to see the results from that and you know, how you can based on that improve the models and so on. Yeah. So, so yes, or, so of course, some some smaller um, some tests in a smaller scale has. Are also done. You saw from the video that uh, this video was taken during one of the times that the thing was uh, test, tested for a part of the network. So uh, the test, the small scale scale testing, is part of the development also. But uh, yes, I mean this, yeah. Yeah, cool. But I mean, it's 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 super cool and also very nice that you are so close to um, to application already. So um, we, we are looking forward to also hear back from you after the first application of this, and really see um, how this has been uh, has, how, how this has been performing in the real world um, beyond the tests. Um, I have two questions here in the in the chat to Arno. So Arno, are you still there? Yes, I think. I Could you, you repeat the question? Yes, so let me start with the first question. Um, so Ivanka, hi Ivanka. Uh, Ivanka asks in the, in, the, in the neural network, very interesting approach. What does ah. the evaporation data tell you if you already know the location of small water? Yes, yes, so, so, so a very uh, important question. Uh, we were optimistic that once you find, once you scan the area for water bodies and look at them, hopefully we'll not see, th they will be there. Uh, 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 but actually we see that uh, around 20%, even without seasonality, seasonality is additional challenge. Even not, without seasonality, after let's say two months, let's say 15% of the water body or 20% disappeared and we see new water bodies added. <laughs> so unfortunately we need to, to rescan the area every two months or so, uh, 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 which make the operation more expensive, uh, but otherwise we, we will miss many. Um, we have two, two approaches for that. One is based on temperature, humidity, rainfall, etc. And, and there is, is almost physics, yes. If it's more, if temperature is higher and humidity uh, uh, lower, you have a, a faster evaporation. And different approach is just 
uh, uh, by analyzing, because, because after finding the water bodies, people go and spray them. And when they spray them, they report if the water body has been evaporated. And then by using this data, we can set the time of the next uh, scanning of the area. Uh, hope it was a useful answer. Thanks, and um, in fact, I feel free to follow up in the chat or in, in, the, in the neural network if you want to know more about this. Um, Jihyeon Lee is also following up on the same question. Um, and he, he thinks that this Krotos approach can be applied for flooding, flooding area predictions. So do you have any, do you, I imagine you're focusing solely on the use case of malaria right now, which is already a big topic, but do you have ideas on how to scale it up for other use cases? Yeah, I have no idea, but it is a very interesting question. I, I actually want to think about it. I don't have an answer now. Great. So um, I don't see questions anymore um, in the chat. So I will um, continue maybe um, with, um, with Daniel. Um, So yeah, that, that's actually a very interesting question here. Um, the question is, how does your labeling approach that you've presented here transfer to other types of damage? Is there something that you've already in check or in plans? So yeah, we were considering the first extension to flooding. And it uh, so it turns out that it's very difficult to switch from point labels to the segmentation areas of the flooding. And uh, there are not many works that use just the RGB channels to estimate the flooded areas. And we're focusing only on RGB channels. So we need to find out some good I guess examples, some good approaches to estimate at least some rough areas of flood, or we potentially need to do some initial retraining on the crowd labeled areas for flood, and then we can potentially go from there. Cool. Thank I will now go over to, um, and if you have any questions on the panelists, if you have any questions for the other panelists, because they're probably like doing also something that's, that's very interesting for you, please feel free to, to jump in. I will just ask, um, ask um, um, Maria again, um, question for me, um, A, is there, um, for the first example about the movement and directions, uh, is there already a concrete idea, maybe I missed it in your presentation, on how to use that for disaster risk management? Uh, what are potential use cases of that? And B, and I assume it's very difficult, but B, to also use it in conjunction with, the, with your second use case, which is the first AIDS, um, the first AIDS system. So because I can imagine that real-time data and seeing how people move in, in certain uh, situations could be very useful. Yeah. Um, actually, for this, uh, for the first case, this with the detection and tracking. Uh, okay, so I shown a video with the vehicles. Uh, to be honest, the vehicles, the vehicles is we, we haven't we haven't done it for the emergency response. Uh, the thing that we developed for emergency response is the person detector. So the person detector is uh, useful. Uh, we believe in um, in search and rescue uh, applicate things. Uh, because actually, yes, that's why I show this video with the drone that was flying very high, and also we have tested it. If it's if it's dark, if, if when it starts to become a bit dark, and I mean, the, and the conditions are not very good. I mean, they are when they are, for example, when we have missing persons in these operations, they are trying to in the forest or in the areas that even the, the access is difficult. Uh, it's not very easy to fly the drone and, and try to locate people in the in the video. So the, the, this is the the, 
the the a that the they will have the video from the drone and the video will identify the the people also the we are generally in collaboration with the cyprus civil defense uh, in, in various projects and they said that they are also interested in uh, tracking their own teams sometimes so search and re they deploy search and rescue teams or teams that they are going in in the field for some emergency and for some reason they are going somewhere that they they lose contact through the through the walkie talkies or the or the mobile phones for some time so they, they really want to be able to to find them sometimes and yeah that's that's the the background and uh, no worries if you can't answer this. I mean, is there, is there an idea to couple that with the direct emergency response system that you had? Like that was your second case study? Or is that basically impossible? Because I think I see uh, the drone is flying over once and establishes a map, right? So yes, it, yes, of course, it, it can be done. I mean, the, because the, it can't, yes. But I mean, in, the, in this platform that, in, yeah, that I showed with the second one, the, uh, as I said, we, we are already in the development of this. So uh, yes, this actually, actually this platform is, um, we can build many, many, many things in, on top of this. So yes. Cool. Um, and one last question um, that I noted down here. Ah, yeah. Uh, is there any idea of, of using different kind of, of also sensors for the drones um, and like thermal images to couple up with that to, to improve the system, for example? Yes, actually, we do. We do. We do this. This thing. I mean, for, uh, for example, in for the. Um, for the for the first example, for the person detector I showed you, uh, we have uh, so the, the the detection is done uh, on uh, a, an image that is taken from a conventional camera and it's an MR and a spectral camera. So we combine both images and we are working on top of this result. And also, uh, I mean, the, the different cameras and different sensors are useful for different uh, things. So, for example, to detect fires, um, you, you are um, this kind of imaging is better than the other, and this kind of stuff. But we also we also combine. I mean, some algorithms are are, are uh, executed on combined uh, combined input from multiple cameras. Yeah, that's fascinating because I think you, you can do, I mean, once you have built the model, you can do so much, so many things to like extend, improve, and things like with this. Um, I mean, I just wanted to alert all the audience that the questions are still open, so feel free. I mean, I'm not running out of questions so quickly myself, but it shouldn't be like a dialogue with me and the panelists. Um, let me ask Daniel and... Um, uh, Daniel and Arnold again, and, and sorry for always pregnancy, pregnancy, you and one that you have like for me, like for my like non, um, non technical view, probably you have similar approaches in, in the sense that you try to do something with, the, with an algorithm and then verify it with um, by crowdsourcing. Um, so the question is have you thought of what comes? after it. So basically you have produced that information, how to produce decision ready data out of the system that you have that you have established. Uh, or is it basically uh, or is it basically uh, then for the um, for the communities, for example, in your example, Arnon, uh, for them to go into the database themselves and draw their own conclusions, or is there anything that is basically given as an advice on how to fight in area and also in, in your example that Uh, so, I think Arno is not uh, in the call, so I will probably okay. uh, yeah, go. So it will be all on you. Okay, so so there are, I think, a few parts in the question. So I, in our applications for the disaster response, I think 
yeah, all we do is we provide the data for the disaster responders. So we don't actually focus on any other areas. And I guess this only goes specifically to the responders so that they can professionally handle this and they don't need to focus on the analysis of the data themselves. So yeah, we can potentially improve and speed up our methods. We can switch to more self-supervision approaches, but uh, I think, yeah, the only people who are going to consume it, it would be the professional responders. So did I ask for, <laughs> for the question? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so um, one of the questions also here that is still on my sheet is um, that, the, this, that the approach you described, uh, Daniel, is um, involves the point labels. And the question is, can you go to a fully self-supervised algorithm for new data based on probably what you have collected in the past? Uh, yes, it would be a long-term uh, goal for us, but currently all the self-supervision approaches require much more computational power. And in our approach, we just add the small overhead for processing the point labels. So potentially when we have more established uh, infrastructure, we can switch to more self-supervision and uh, maybe provide only the most complex cases to the human volunteers. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so let me just review my question catalog. Um, so I have some for Arno, who is not here anymore. Um, I mean, a question, or for Maria again. Um, so you're basically you you have said I think you have teaser teased that like that some of what you what you're producing in in kiosk um, is basically is made available for others, right? So are you aware of of others already starting to using the technology, um, or what? How would you how would you uh, encourage or how are you trying? trying to encourage that, that you make what you're developing is being used widely, probably even within the European Union, which have uh, like kind of standardized, um, not standardized, but at least um, to some extent, um, similar systems. Um, yeah, actually, uh, <laughs> Um, as I mentioned, the research, okay, the research center is established in 2008. And uh, it was initially a small center. So now the last two, three years, we are becoming bigger. And uh, it's also, uh, so it's uh, now that we are becoming bigger, we started um, this, uh, this um, uh, we are trying to put, to make other work available to, I mean, to op in open access. And uh, we are starting also to promote it. Uh, so we are, yeah, we are, we want to, we are, we really want to, to go into this, but it's, uh, we are, we are still in, in the beginning. So, yeah, in promoting this. So, no, we are, uh, to be honest, uh, we are not aware that uh, of some uh, specific uh, other groups or other um, organizations that are, that used uh, our uh, software or things like that, or the code or anything. Um, yeah, apart from the apart from the authorities, for example, here in Cyprus, for for, for example, for, for for which we develop some of the things, because as I mentioned, some of the things we develop them in collaboration with some uh, organizations of the Cyprus, and they are using. It. Yeah, some of them are our making them available in open access and we are yeah we started um, trying with the promotion very cool so i think at this point because no new questions are coming in and we are we are approaching the closing time um i would like to to thank my panelists here uh 
Maria, Daniel, and also Arnon, who seem to have dropped out. Uh, I think we have seen three fantastic, um, or actually like five fantastic use cases, three from Maria and one from Daniel and uh, one from Arnon, uh, about like how, um, how, how AI can be used um, for uh, disaster risk management. Um, in, in various states of development um, and, and maturity, but I think there there's one one common theme here. I think that that yeah, we we are we are in in the middle of a paradigm shift in terms of how we approach um, uh, natural disaster risk management, and also in terms of how we can how can, how we can make our our systems ready for that, uh, prepared, but also for for restoring them after. Um, as my as I'm coming from the climate change world, um, and my my, my 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 field is climate change adaptation, I'm I'm very um, I'm very uh, positive about these these things because once we can apply these um, to to a direct disaster response or preparedness, we can also widen it and, and apply different climate models to it uh, in the end, and also um, like to use what you are developing here for natural disaster risk management for, um, for, for aligning out different climate scenarios and, and helping the world adapt to climate change. Um, and also what I really like to see today is that, um, that there has been, that, that, that these are very mature and um, robust, um, uh, or seem to be very robust uh, technologies and uh, algorithms and that in, in most cases, they even have some kind of on, on the ground verification uh, or at least testing, which is something that often like, um, that often is, is forgotten in the process. So thanks to Daniel, Arnon, and Maria. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure Michael is, is proud about us, proud of us because we are, we are closing exactly in the time box. Have a great, great day. And um, the rest of the webinar um, was a pleasure. And back to my thing. Thank you, David. Absolutely. So thank you for being uh, dot on time. <laughs> thank you for ending on time. And thank you for taking us to the discussions. Thank you to all the other panelists as well. Um, we will now move on to the last session of the webinar. So for that, I would like to pass the floor to Ms. Alice, who is the Director of International GNSSS Service Central Bureau at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Michelle. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Uh, okay, well, uh, we've had some really interesting uh, presenters thus far, and I'm really looking forward to introducing this next session, our next uh, panel of speakers with you. Uh, we will be uh, starting off with Mustafa Mosavi. Uh, my apologies if I've uh, mispronounced your name, uh, who is a geophysicist with expertise in se seismic signal processing, applied machine learning, representation learning, and pattern recognition in large sensor data sets. His work focuses on the interface of earthquake and exploration seismology, and is an interdisciplinary blend of seismology, statistics, and computer science. Mustafa, the floor is yours. Mustafa, if you're speaking, we, we can't hear you. Okay. So, uh, yeah, but now you can hear me and see the shirt, the screen, right? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, invitation and also nice introduction. Uh, uh, this webinar is about the AI application for natural uh, disaster management. And I'm going to uh, present you how AI could help us to detect earthquake signal, uh, signals better and improving uh, the monitoring of earthquakes. 
First of all, I should say that um, currently we cannot predict earthquake. The best seismologists can do is to provide seismic hazard maps like this one that provides a long-term probability of ex uh, experiencing strong ground uh, shaking due to earthquake. Uh, these seismic hazard maps are uh, built based on some geological information like fault distribution and historic uh, earthquake. So earthquake monitoring and documenting the time, location, and size of earthquake is an important part of the seismic hazard uh, assessment process. So only by monitoring of uh, mid-size to large earthquakes, we can gain a lot of information about large scale processes on the earth. And what you see here are aftershocks of uh, the uh, 9.1 uh, Honshu earthquake in Japan and the seismicity of one, the boundaries of active tectonic plates around Pacific Ocean. Uh, which is also known as the Ring of Fire. So um, just looking at the earthquake, we get this uh, relatively coarse and large scale uh, information about the earthquake, how they spurt uh, mainly along, and along the active part of the uh, boundaries and much lesser squeak like around the uh, US. But even with this scale of earthquake monitoring, we can see some interesting features like these earthquake that happen at the middle of uh, US that based on our seismic hazard map, we did not expect to have any large earthquake. Uh, if for instance, we zoom in around these two, uh, earthquake in Arkansas. And we see two magnitude four earthquake that occur at the middle of country where no tectonic activities exist. And uh, this is almost all we can say based on typical earthquake catalog. Uh, with this information, we cannot explain why these earthquake uh, happen uh, in a location that had no history of large seismicity in the past. However, if you look at the data recorded by some seismic instrument in the region, we could see many more uh, earthquakes that, although were not reported by uh, seismic monitoring agencies, they have been captured by our seismic sensors. And the reason that normally these are smaller earthquakes uh, are not detected and reported by monitoring agencies is mainly because the traditional algorithms that are commonly used by agencies are not efficient and effective enough to fully process all of these weaker signals that occur much more frequently. And to extract the earthquake information from recorded ground motions, uh, and build an earthquake catalog, these are the main processing steps that one needs to perform. Uh, we have started empowering our earthquake monitoring pipeline by using deep neural network to detect all those smaller earthquake signals that uh, under recorded data and peaking the time in times of two distinct seismic energy arrivals that are necessary to characterize the earthquake location. After detecting and characterizing all those smaller earthquakes or seismicity picture of that area in central Arkansas now is totally different. Now, not only we can identify a previously unknown fault, we can investigate why this fault has been triggered. Uh, we see that uh, while there was some wastewater injection activities in the area by the oil and gas companies, uh, 
before 2010, the earthquake seems to start shortly after injection of uh, this wheel, which happens to be closely around the fault. And now we can see the interaction between the earthquake, the smaller macro earthquake, act like a connecting glue between the apparently isolated two magnitude four earthquake that we uh, saw at the beginning. So this high resolution, uh, by improving our ability to detect and locate a smaller earthquake, we can now build high resolution image of fault structure and get better view of how earthquakes interact with each other or how they spread out along the fault and how they get started and even how they get stopped. So this was just a small demonstration of uh, power of AI for uh, monitoring the earthquake over an area, area of a several kilometers. We saw how monitoring earthquakes with a fine resolution can improve our understanding of how one earthquake leads to the next one. Now just imagine, that if we instead of the O7 instrument, we apply all these modern AI-based techniques to seismic data that for years have been continuously recorded by thousands of instruments all over the world, how much we can learn about the Earth and its earthquakes. This is why in the past few years, we continue developing uh, several other deep learning models for other tasks in earthquake monitoring uh, procedure. Uh, some of these models are still in early stages of uh, proof of concept, but some uh, others are already used in production stage by many other researchers and uh, monitoring agency for routine for routine processing of seismic data and performing earthquake detection and monitoring. So in summary, AI can help us to process large volume seismic data and, monitoring, uh, and monitor earthquake, not only more efficiently, or effectively, but also more efficiently and precisely. As a result, we can extract new information and insight uh, from same data and instrumentation. And of course, there are still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, so with that, uh, thank, uh, I'm done with my presentation and thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you and, and perfectly timed as well. <laughs> All right, so moving along, our next speaker is uh, Valentino Constantino. Uh, he's a data science a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab with the Technology User Evaluation and Infusion Office, where he develops recommender systems and open source software. Prior to joining JPL, he graduated from Northwestern University's Master of Science in Analytics program and from the University of Tennessee, uh, both in the United States. Uh, Valentino, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Allison. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. All right, let me go ahead and turn my screen here this thing going. So thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about leveraging AI for the detection of ionospheric disturbances and with that uh, natural hazards. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, I want to highlight that I'm presenting today. You know, as Allison mentioned, I'm at NASA JPL. I'm a data scientist there. Um, but this is really a collaboration of a very broad team, um, you know, both at JPL um, and at other universities uh, in Europe and in the United States. So I do want to highlight that. And so a quick idea of what we're going to go through. We'll talk about uh, what the big idea is, our motivation and the background, um, why we want to leverage artificial intelligence um, for natural hazards detection in regards to the ionosphere how we will leverage GPS receivers to perform real-time detection. Um, and lastly, there's some information in an appendix. If uh, you find this information useful, uh, please feel free to reach out and I can circulate the, the slides with you uh, after today. All right, so what's the big idea here? Why would we want to leverage uh, the ionosphere for natural hazards detection? 
So here's some background and motivation. Um, one natural hazard that we have, I mean, and recently in the Tonga event, which is, uh, you know, fresh in everyone's minds is uh, tsunami waves, you know, and as we know, they have devastating consequences and dramatic costs in human lives as well. Uh, so somewhere in between uh, 2000 and 2001, there was at least over a quarter million uh, casualties uh, related to tsunami waves. And so um, it's a rare threat, but a significant one and one that we want to monitor. Um, tsunami waves also result in significant economic losses, right? So not just the human cost. Um, the Tohoku event in Japan in 2011, you know, that event cost tens of billions of USD to Japan and took many years for Japan to cover and for their GDP to recover. Um, so not only is there a human cost, but also a significant economic one. And currently the state of the uh, art and tsunami threat assessment is limited. So it kind of provides us with an opportunity for advancement. Um, dart ocean buoys, they're sparsely uh, populated uh, in and around ocean coasts. And there's no detection and tracking of tsunami waves currently in open ocean or deep ocean. So there's no visibility um, while that threat, you know, for example, from Tonga progresses to, you know, the US West Coast, there's no visibility. However, tsunamis do create oceanic perturbations, um, and these oceanic perturbations generate upward traveling atmospheric waves. When those atmospheric waves hit the ionosphere about 100 to 300 kilometers up in altitude, they perturb electron densities. And those total electron densities or that total electron content, those perturbations um, can be measured and are sensitive to uh, by global navigation satellite systems, uh, GNSS satellites, so GPS, GLONASS, uh, Baidu networks. So given that we know that, that these sense, uh, networks are sensitive to TEC perturbations, we can uh, use that to our advantage and detect um, you know, threats like you see here. And here's one example. Um, you see these perturbations here on the left-hand side, these time series, these are all indications of, uh, from, the uh, sorry, from the Tonga event actually recently, these are all perturbations uh, that could be detected with, um, you know, with uh, some machine learning. Um, but this is a pretty easy to detect waveform, right? So why would we leverage machine learning? Um, well, machine learning can detect a broad range of patterns and specifically deep learning is able to detect a broad range of nonlinear combinations of patterns, which um, if we're trying to detect TEC perturbations might be useful. Um, more importantly, TEC perturbations can be caused not only by tsunami waves, but by other types of natural hazards like meteorite uh, impacts and large explosions. And, uh, and an artificial intelligence approach uh, with further development could be able to detect uh, those different source types. And that's actually one of our long-term goals. And so this is how um, the AI works in process. Uh, we have some information from the JPL Global Differential System, GPS, PD, GPS. We form slant CEC, uh, total electron content from each KNSS link. We perform some signal processing, and then this is fed into our AI ML approach, which together with some of the other information is used to produce a tsunami warning. All right, so how do we do this, right? How do we leverage the artificial intelligence? Um, we'll be brief here, um, but you know, in the discussion, we can go into more detail. And as always, we can discuss a little more. All right, so how do we leverage art, artificial intelligence for this task? Um, I do want to point out that random forests have been previously used uh, for this, which is another type of machine learning approach. Um, these are tree-based models. Um, you know, they're great. They're very descriptive. Um, they offer a lot of explanatory power. However, they do consume a lot of memory at larger scales. And the authors do uh, point this out in the paper and suggest exploring convolutional neural networks. Um, CNNs or convolutional neural networks are a, a computer vision approach for uh, in deep learning. Um, one important aspect here is that our approach must be uh, robust to missing data. Um, ground stations and satellites only come in contact periodically, so there's a large gap uh, in the sequence, for example. So um, a lot of more traditional time series approaches uh, would not work here without significant interpolation of the missing data. Um, and importantly, the approach should be extensible. I mentioned wanting to detect other types of TEC perturbations and natural hazards in the future. So, um, you know, we wanted to go with an approach that we felt would be extensible in the future. Um, and we noticed that the 2012 Haida Gawai earthquake provides a use case. In that use case, the G10 satellite detected a perturbation generated by tsunami wave about uh, eight minutes before landfall. And so we can leverage these known events to generate an experiment. Um, we use three events for model training. 
those immense being the 2010 Mali earthquake, the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, and the 2012 Haida Gawaii earthquake and tsunami. And so we use those events for model training and model testing. And then uh, we use an event in Chile uh, in 2015, the Illapel earthquake and tsunami wave that occurred three years later after the, uh, after the uh, latest training data as validation. Um, we offer this and we, we wanna note that deep learning models also offer uh, reduced feature engineering, which is a big um, you know, reason why we went with, with the deep learning approach. But how did we do this? Well, we use an approach called Gramian angular difference fields to convert the time series or windows of time series into images so we could actually train this machine learning model. Um, and this is a little in depth, but essentially um, these approaches convert a window of time series to a set of polar coordinates and then those polar coordinates are transformed into an image. And now that we have an image based representation of the time series, we can use that to train a computer vision based model um, uh, on a time series approach, which normally wouldn't be um, you know, something that you apply, but we found that it worked really well here. And this is kind of what that looks like. You know, Once we use that approach to translate these windows into images, um, you can see the one on the left-hand side, which contains the perturbation as a pretty distinct pattern. Um, this is what we're trying to detect. On the right-hand side, it kind of looks a little bit more like noise. This would be background uh, total electron content. This is a uh, brief diagram of the overall pipeline. And so you can see we have some training data you know, that we encode with Gramian angular fields. We train a model. And then once we have that trained model, we take unseen TEC data from a later event or a real-time event. We convert this unseen data into um, our images. We feed that into the trained model and we make predictions. And with that, you know, here's a selected view of some of the results. Um, these are all from the same satellite, G24, on the 2015 Illipel earthquake. Um, you might notice that we do make some true positives, which is very encouraging. Um, and there's a few false positives, um, you know, particularly on the top left um, for uh, the true uh, band. And so we did notice that there were a couple instances, quite a few instances where we had some false positives. So we set about an approach to, um, to uh, overcome that. Uh, we came up with a really simple approach to mitigating false positives, essentially taking a look at a particular satellite which connects to multiple ground stations. Um, we say we need a large enough share of those ground stations to have an anomaly detected in order to uh, be considered a true anomaly. And this is a surprisingly effective approach. Um, you know, we set that value to, uh, to 60% and we were able to achieve a 91.7% F1 score, uh, which that's on a scale from 0 to 100. Um, you know, regardless, even if you're not familiar with that uh, metric in machine learning, 100% uh, is the best, 91.7 is pretty good. Looking forward, you know, we got some strong experimental results. You know, we were happy with 91.7%. Um, however, we'd like to have some additional training data in our training set and additional validation data as well. We validated on one unseen event. Um, however, we'd like to do it on some more. Um, and more importantly, we hope that future versions of this approach could also be extensible to other types of natural hazards beyond tsunami. Uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Valentino. And we are right on time again. Uh, and on to our final speaker of the session, uh, Maria Joao Souza, uh, who is a mechanical engineering graduate from Instituto Superior Tecnico with a specialization in systems. And she is currently a research fellow and PhD student at IDMEC and IST. Her research work focuses on cooperative robotics and intelligent sensors for wildfire detection and monitoring. Uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, an uh, in the wildfire uh, application. Uh, I am glad that we have already had some today. So uh, some of these concepts are uh, will not be completely new. This work is developed uh, at IDMEC and ADAI alongside Alexander Motin and Miguel Almeida. Um, so wildfires um, uh, are a global hazard and um, have had uh, increasing severity in recent years. Uh, so we are very concerned with uh, both wildfire detection in early stages uh, because many of these fires are close to the wildland urban interface and threaten communities directly. So it's very important to the early, early detection aspect. 
but also the monitoring aspect when the fires escalate more and uh, gain larger proportions and have to be monitored for a longer period, but the real-time element is very important. Uh, in that context, uh, AI is a powerful tool that can enable um, uh, applications to mitigate these effects. So uh, we mapped out uh, some applications for uh, image-based tasks, uh, not limited to the response stage uh, where detection and monitoring falls in, but also to prevention, pre preparedness, uh, response and recovery. We have covered some of, of these uh, aspects uh, in, in this workshop today, so I won't go much into it, and we'll focus on the response uh, element. So our proposal uh, falls between the satellite solutions and the low altitude solutions, but incorporates uh, basically low altitude uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and also high altitude balloons. So we propose a network of sensing agents incorporating uh, high altitude sensing, low altitude sensing and ground level sensing. The idea is that this mobile infrastructure uh, can adapt to environmental changes. So uh, it doesn't rely on a fixed uh, stationary infrastructure. Uh, the distribution estimation uh, and the cooperative nature of the system allows it to uh, distribute the workload and make it more efficiently and less demanding on each agent. And uh, the intelligent inference is at the end is what will enable the early warnings and the real-time monitoring. But to basically realize this sort of system, uh, we understand that um, uh, processing image data is at the, the center of it. So uh, a first stage is look at what uh, wildfire uh, image databases look like. Uh, and that is a starting point. Uh, I'm having trouble progressing to the next slide. Yeah, we are there. So uh, if we look online, most of the uh, imagery you get from a search engine will look very much like this. This is very homogeneous and very not like what you would find if you're trying to detect an early fire or actually monitor a fire. Uh, so, but unfortunately, this is much of what you'll find in the literature uh, in papers because it's much of the data you can find without collecting it yourself. So, but what we actually need is more like a lot more variability of conditions uh, so that if we deploy a robot, uh, it has seen at least uh, a decent amount of uh, scenarios um, and experienced some failure modes. So this opens uh, two questions. The first one is how do we create these data sets? And uh, this is, a general approach, uh, it applies to any large scale applic uh, new application that regards a large scale data set. So basically we def the devise these approaches to, to develop uh, curated data sets that have ground truths validated by experts and uh, that can enable uh, outputs uh, uh, data creation uh, that can enable machine learning algorithms to learn from these large data sets. Uh, and the main goal here is to improve the, the large scale uh, annotation automatically uh, without significant energy constraints. So we are not worried like if uh, our um, algorithms take too much computing, if they can take their, their time, it's not, we are interested in having very fine grained uh, annotations. Um, like the example I will show next. So for instance, we are more interested in uh, grasping the fine detail and developing algorithms that can uh, annotate this uh, data automatically. Uh, so then we can use AI uh, on this data. But this 
uh, takes a lot of compute uh, to process and time, which is not efficient for deploying on a robot afterwards. So um, it, it's important to think about other ways that we can uh, develop deployed or deployment oriented algorithms that are more efficient to deploy in the real world. So uh, in that sense, uh, it's unavoidable to, to do some data collection uh, so that we can have the data streams that we need and we can explore the failure modes of the sensors and uh, actually validate them in the real world. Uh, in order to develop uh, those low weight, efficient AI models. So this comes to the, the fun part uh, that where you, you can actually deploy a robot with a bunch of sensors uh, and uh, do experiments in very controlled uh, scenarios where you know how much you're burning, how much you're supposing to detect, like the diameters of the ignition you're supposed to detect. Uh, and actually uh, validate the sensor's readings um, on a very well-known uh, scenario. Moving forward, um, it, in a summary, the main goal here is not uh, to, to have very uh, high performance on the very little detail, but have um, uh, very efficient models that can run in real time at a high uh, frame rate, uh, and that at least the, the processing speed uh, is fast and the accuracy is uh, very good on a course level, at least uh, without uh, concerning uh, much about uh, detail. This is what uh, was uh, the presentation of our tour approach. Uh, I'm open to any questions you may have and you have my contact here in case there's other questions you can cannot explore today. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And, and thank you to, to all of our uh, panelists for the session. Uh, it's now time for our discussion. And so I would invite uh, uh, um, Maria and Valentino and Mosafa to all uh, turn on your cameras and uh, if anyone has any questions, please do feel feel free to use the Q and A, and uh, yeah, please uh, please feel free. I think I will I will start off actually with a question for Mustafa. Uh, what is the current state of AI based systems applications by earthquake monitoring agency? Uh, well, uh, uh, some of the models, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, like earthquake detectors and phase speakers are uh, in a very advanced uh, stage and currently are used by a lot of researchers around the world and uh, many of the uh, earthquake monitoring agencies uh, for routine processing of the earthquake. So, we can say AI-based earthquake monitoring uh, is now happening like in daily basis. Uh, but there are some other area like earthquake location, or association or other like steps that uh, are still in like research uh, phase and like um, more robust models are developed every day by researchers. Uh, so I would say is too close and too far in some uh, extent. And how well do you, do you, would you say that the deep learning earthquake detectors generalize to other data sets? Uh, 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 earthquake detector, but for now, uh, 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 we know that for sure they generalize very well. There have been many studies. We applied these uh, models that have been trained by some specific type of earthquake in a specific region and which they extend very well to the other regions, other type of earthquakes, uh, other type of sensors data. They generalize very well. Uh, it seems like Deep neural networks, especially convolutional and recurrent neural networks, 
tends to learn very well characteristic of seismic signals uh, from training data set. So uh, they, their generalization is uh, really, really good. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, again, uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A. Um, I will just let's move on to um, Valentino. Uh, the solution you propose, which leverages uh, deep learning, has thus far only been shown as viable with tsunami-induced total electron content perturbations. Uh, what are the next steps for extending this approach to detecting other uh, perturbations in the atmosphere? And what are the biggest challenges? Sure. Okay, great question. Um, you know, so I mentioned that TEC perturbations, you know, can be caused by tsunami waves, but also types of other uh, natural hazards, you know, such as fire, large fires, or, you know, meteor impacts, meteorite impacts, explosions, uh, things of that nature. Um, you know, and so these signals also show up as, um, you know, per perturbations in that, you know, as waveforms in the background TEC signal. Um, you know, as Mustafa mentioned, and, you know, as previous work has shown uh, in several areas, uh, deep learning, uh, deep neural networks in particular, and particular convolutional neural networks um, that take advantage of, you know, imagery, um, they are able to generalize really well to nonlinear patterns. And so, um, you know, the next step for us is really to, you know, and this is kind of the grungy part, the non, uh, the non-attractive part of the of machine learning engineering. Um, but, you know, we need to get some subject matter experts together and put together, um, you know, canonical uh, data set essentially for, for training. Um, you know, these are TEC perturbations that were caused by, you know, a volcanic eruption. These were caused by the tsunami wave. Um, you know, these were caused by meteorite impacts, so on and so forth. Um, for us, that's probably the big next steps, um, you know, and then we'll train uh, more than likely the same architecture that we employed um, in our initial experiments just to have uh, some commonality, um, some benchmarking, um, and that would be kind of the big next step for us. And um, while I have you, you've shown in some experiments that detecting uh, TEC perturbations in near real time is a practical possibility with this approach. Uh, has it yet been integrated into live data streams? Good question. Um, so no, I mean, so so far we've been working with historical data sets and we've been simulating a real-time stream. So, um, you know, I did mention that we use uh, three events for uh, training and then we used uh, a single unseen event for uh, validation. So with that unseen event, um, we progressed through that unseen event um, chronologically, you know, as if that data was coming in as a real-time stream. Um, and that's how we uh, performed the predictions. And uh, from those predictions, uh, you know, calculated the metrics that we uh, reported. Um, but our next step uh, as well, another big step for us, uh, and this comes prior to extending uh, the um, approach to other types of TEC uh, perturbations. Uh, but the next step for us is really to integrate more deeply with JPL's guardian system and into that real-time uh, detection network, because um, that'd be a big next step. Um, it would allow us to gain a little bit insight about what's needed from an operational system. Um, and then importantly, feed the knowledge and expertise back into um, the approach when we decide, decide to extend it. Looking forward to seeing your, your next steps and partially because uh, we do work together from time to time. So it's a great to see this, this um, moving forward and it has a, a great number of possibilities. Uh, okay, um, Maria, uh, if I may put you on the spot, um, what do you think are the, the key opportunities and challenges for AI applications in wildfire, wildfire detection and monitoring, uh, namely in the research and deployment stages? Thanks for the question. Uh, definitely, there there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, the the field is, is still growing. Uh, the lack of data sets is uh, a real challenge, and uh, is something that uh, it takes an immense amount of effort, and uh, it, it takes very large teams to develop these sort of uh, experimental trials. Even these ones, there were more specific for, for us that we wanted to test very specific things about the sensors, but larger ones are also uh, difficult to, to do. Uh, but there, there are definitely uh, many opportunities because there are also uh, 
unfortunately, many challenges in, in the response to these events that require uh, new solutions. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, would you mind expanding on the current impl implementation barriers and any re relevant uh, open issues when you're considering the pathway of impact? Um, there are definitely uh, some uh, that are concerning to the research itself uh, that uh, is hard, like uh, uh, the autonomy problem is not uh, particular to the to the wildfire detection application. It's a robotics uh, limitation that uh, uh, will uh, continuously try to overcome, but uh, the the energy that uh, a flying robot needs to operate is very high and very demanding. Uh, and the AI solutions are also very demanding, demanding co computing wise. So there's, there's, uh, there are very much open problems there to try to uh, find uh, more efficient solutions. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of pathway to impact, if we have like all the technology, all the research uh, ready now, there would be many regulatory issues still with deploying uh, autonomous robots, particularly flying robots, uh, because the airspace is a very tricky place to operate in. Uh, so definitely there are many uh, steps to take in, in the direction of and having uh, autonomous uh, flying robots uh, performing uh, civil uh, applications. Very cool. Um, just uh, give the to give the speakers any any time. Do, do you um, do you have any questions for each other? I know it's been very kind of uh, a speaking uh, with the audience, but if you had any any questions for each other, please do feel free to to speak up. Um, if not, I think that everyone's contact information was shared in their in their presentations, and so um, I, again, I would. Uh, still encourage if you have any questions and if you'd like to put them into the Q&A box, uh, we can make sure that uh, our speakers are able to answer them uh, answer them there. So I would, I would at this point, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, our speakers, uh, Mosava, Valentino and Maria, and, uh, and turn the floor back over to uh, Maitali and uh, Monique for closing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alison. Thank you to all the panelists as well. Thank you for taking us to the last session. Um, so I think we're way ahead of schedule, but I guess we can proceed to the last agenda item that we have on the program, for which I would like to pass the floor to Monique Kuglich, who is the focus group on AI for Natural Disaster Management Chair. So Monique, if you would like to take the floor for closing remarks, over to you. Thank you, Maitali. So as all good things must come to an end, I will now be closing the webinar. But before we leave, I'd like to make a few acknowledgements. Um, given that today was a collaboration among three UN bodies, uh, it was really wonderful to have representatives of the ITU, WMO, and UN Environment open the event. So many thanks to Dr. Chase Sibley, Professor Jörg Luderbacher, and Dr. Morali Thumarukudi for your thoughtful opening remarks. I'd like to thank our prominent keynote speakers, Dr. Anthony Ria from WMO, Professor Kathy Whaler of the University of Edinburgh and IUGG, and Professor David Higgett of Lancaster University College at Beijing Jat Tong University and AOGS, who gave insight into how AI-based technologies and DRR feature in your roles and organizations. Thank you to our enthusiastic moderators, Dr. Andrea Toretti from the European Commission's JRC, Mr. David Oeman from the UNFCCC, and Ms. Alison Craddock of NASA JPL for helping to facilitate the sessions and for catalyzing some great discussions. Thank you to our fantastic speakers from storm surges and wildfires to earthquakes, tsunamis, and vector-borne diseases. Today, we were able to explore many ways that geospatial data and AI can be used to help us better understand, detect, forecast and communicate natural hazards and disasters. These presentations were very insightful, inspirational and complementary to the goals of the focus group. Coordinating an event of this size and length is no small feat and I would like to express my appreciation to the team at the AI for Good Global Summit, 
Many thanks to Dr. Reinhard Scholl, Mr. Fred Werner, Mr. Jinu Um, Ms. Xenia Fontaine, Dr. Bastian Quast, Mr. Jero Jung, and of course, Ms. Anna the Avatar. I would also like to acknowledge the contributions made by the focus group management and the focus group advisor, Ms. Maitali Menin, who helped develop the webinar program and promote the event. And also, Maitali, thank you for walking us through today's event. You did a great job. Finally, I would like to thank everyone who joined us today to listen, to learn, and to contribute. And I strongly encourage anyone who enjoyed today's webinar to consider participating in several upcoming events. Next week, the focus group will be contributing a landslide use case at the Start Summit Hackathon in St. Gallen, Switzerland. And from the 7th to 9th of June, the focus group will hold a hybrid meeting at the ITU in Geneva, Switzerland, where we will continue to explore the potential and pitfalls of using AI to manage natural disasters. Registration will be possible over our focus group website, and I look forward to seeing you on site or online. Thank you very much for taking part in today's event and take care. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the satisfaction survey, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the 30-minute networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits and poster boards, and build your personalized AI for good program. It was a pleasure learning with you today. See you at the next AI for good.
Mm-hmm. <laughs> 